All right, folks, let's get started. I want to officially call the meeting to order. Uh, we do have one member absent, and that's Planning Board Member Baber. Other than that, we are good to go. First order of business, we're going to consider approval of the May 23rd, 2023 regular meeting minutes. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the May 23rd, 2023 regular meeting minutes. Second. All right. Any discussion on the minutes? No? Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? I'm sorry. Jay. All right, that passes unanimously. All right, uh, all public, public, that's what they are, public comments are related to agenda item 4C. So what we'll do, we'll go ahead and just uh, tackle these two text amendments that we have, 4A, 4B, then we'll go ahead for public comments to 4C, and then we'll jump into that. So going ahead to the actual action agenda, First item on the agenda is petition TA 23-03. That's a request by the Huntersville Planning Department for a text amendment to amend Article 2 of the Subdivision Ordinance and Article 7.5 of the Zoning Ordinance to limit minor subdivision to five lots or less and to require a 10-foot buffer for minor subdivisions within the rural and transitional residential zoning districts. Mr. Paper, go for it, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I will put my enter my staff report into the record. And so recently, uh, staff has seen larger tracts of land being subdivided under minor subdivision provisions, um, like the one above, resulting in multiple lots created along thoroughfares. Um, the concern that we have is that multiple driveway cuts on thoroughfares with lot layouts based based on minimizing development costs versus the creation of quality subdivisions. Um, multiple driveway cuts increase the likelihood of road conflicts and diminish natural areas along our roadways. Staff feels that the lot layouts and desired best use of the land conflict with the 2040 community plan policies. Um, in order to combat these issues, staff recommends the following text to limit minor subdivisions to five lots. Um, farmhouse clusters would still be considered a minor subdivision, which does allow up to six lots. The town would not be the only municipality in Mecklenburg County to have limits on minor subdivisions, um, as all the other towns currently have one as well. Staff is also proposing that any new residential minor subdivision within the R and TR zoning district be required to provide a minimum 10 foot buffer. This buffer would require any existing trees and shrubs to remain while not requiring new vegetation to be planted in order to not add any further unnecessary burdens. And this buffer, the, pur the purpose of this buffer is to help ensure that neighbors um, are protected from losing any existing visual buffers and further preserve elements of the rural character in sensitive environmental um, areas. And if you guys have any questions, I can answer that for you. Oh, I didn't. Yes, the the buffer would be the uh, the red. Around the property. Okay, so it wouldn't be internal with the new lots being made. It would just be the external border. Correct. Got it. Subdivision. Yes. I'm sorry, Nathan. You said the red border. Would would, would that large tract be out of the subdivision? Or is that you saying that's part of the subdivision on this particular project? The the yellow. No. Uh, like like I was thinking, the, the buffer would go along those back property lines. It, it would follow the whole entire property. So you're taking the whole site before subdivided and putting the, that's where the 10 foot buffer. When you subdivide, when you come in for a new minor subdivision, you would be required to place a 10 foot completely surrounding. Around the perimeter. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. 
So a couple questions, uh, just for clarification. So if they bring in something that's over seven, let's say it automatically is a major subdivision. So it goes everything subdivision. And then the other question is, like in this instance, this Hambright's pretty, you know, well-traveled road. We're still okay with five. How did we come up with five driveways right there? And um, it was kind of just basing off what other municipalities, hmm. municipalities um, have around this area. Yeah. Um, we just felt that it was a good number um, okay. to keep it at. Yeah, I mean, I could see it on a less traveled road, but I mean, it's still, I mean, a lot of people go through there every day, gets backed up when school traffic's in there, right there. I mean, I know you got to draw the line somewhere, but I was just kind of thinking there. So the other what if scenario on this one, if they were to eliminate all the driveways on Hambright and make a like a back alley road, right, where you just have private, like a private, that would be considered a farmhouse cluster at that point if they had like a road coming in the back. A of, private road, yes. Private road with only one drive coming yeah, off. A farmhouse of, cluster, which yeah. you can get up to six lots or two farmhouse clusters at the same time for 12. Okay. Yeah. I guess I, what I'm saying is I don't, really don't want there to be a loophole. Like if all they have to do is put a road there, I don't like those all kind of, you know, fronted in that area. But, you know, it seems like a way out. You could just put a private drive there and call it good. Go ahead. They, they would still have to comply with all the farmhouse cluster requirements, which are, are pretty extensive okay. um, above what a minor subdivision would require. OK. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had a discussion with some members of the planning department about a design. The design, because I know the concern here was the number of driveways these produce out. Uh, and I, I was told that we, what I'm fixing to describe, that some of these exist in Huntersville, and it's not necessarily a farmhouse cluster. You could have t uh, two drives in and out with a private street in front of you, correct? Uh, you and have a minor subdivision. You could have a uh, driveway easement coming off the road connecting to, to multiple lots. And then you'd have a, a street in yeah. front of those houses where you turn into your drives. One existing in the, in the town off of uh, Beatty's Ford Road. All right, and they wouldn't all just have one for the entire subdivision, one or two entrance exits for the entire subdivision you that, have, that looped in. You potentially could. If, if it was on a NCDOT road and approved by NCDOT, you, you could do that. But that would not be a farmhouse cluster. It'd still be a, okay. That's fine. Good. Any other questions? I got a motion. You got a question? He's got a motion. You want to fight him for it? All you also comment to arm wrestle later. Okay. You'll win though. Go for it. And considering the proposed amendment. Um, 2303, TA 2303, the planning board recommends approval based on the amendment being consistent with policies LU 7.1, LU 9.1, LU 11.1, EOS 1.1, EOS 6.1, T 4.1, and T 4.3 of the Huntersville 2040 Community Plan. It is reasonable in the public and in the public interest to amend the zoning ordinance because it will result in higher quality development that will protect the character of Huntersville and is safer for the community. Second. All right. We have a motion. We have a second. Any discussion on this? None? Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? All right, that passes unanimously. Okay, item 4B on the agenda. Uh, it's petition 23-04, sorry, TA 23-04. Also a request by the Huntersville Planning Department to amend Article 9.54, Solar Energy Facilities, to further clarify the text for simplicity. All right, so I'll enter my staff report into the record. Currently, Article 9.54.2, major solar facilities, is split into residential and non-residential sections. We have determined that a major solar facility cannot be located on a residential property because it is its own permitted use, not an accessory use, unlike a minor solar facility. 
Staff proposes to make adjustments to simplify this, simplify this language by removing the residential section. All the previous use general requirements will still apply, including the SUP requirement. On April 6th, the HOAB recommended approval with a vote of eight to zero for approval with a recommendation to remove the reference to NCGS 160D914 within the non-residential portion of a minor solar facility ordinance. Staff agrees with this recommendation as 160D914 only applies to residential properties. Staff originally included this reference to keep residential and non-residential solar panel locations the same. Staff also proposes um, to remove the word slope and replace it with surfaces. Um, do you guys have any questions? I'll answer this for you. Is this thing on? <laughs> um, can you clarify the difference between a major and minor solar facility? Yeah, so a, a minor solar facility is anything like uh, you'd put it on your roof or in your backyard. Um, it's an accessory to the primary use. Uh, a major solar facility would be like a industrial scale facility built purely to generate electricity for use off the site. So it's not based on size or any other limitation, it's context determined? Correct. Okay. Was there any contemplation on whether a size limitation would be helpful? Because what's to stop someone from putting a giant I, solar farm in their backyard if they own enough land? So a, uh, a major solar facility would, is a primary use. So you would not be able to put it on a property where a residential use is already there. We also have requirement that you can only do it on a piece of property that's at least 10 acres. So you would not be able to put it on like a two acre residential property within a subdivision or next to a subdivision. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> this is some of the same things we talked about at the HLAB, but say it here. If a developer came in, let's say we're just talking about a minor subdivision, five houses, lot five lots, and that developer decided he was going to make greenhouses, all with uh, he's going to put the solar panels in and do what he could to, to he or she support uh, uh, green energy for those houses. That would still be a minor. Uh, that would be a minor facility because it's if it was an accessory to the to the home on the property. To the home, but that same developer couldn't have. Uh, place those, a solar farm next to that facility to provide that same power? Um, if it was that would be less than 10 acres. Then he would not be able to. OK, that, I think someday that will come back. In order to, to do it on less than that, we would have to, to do it. I understand. I'm just saying, like I, I see being reasonable in the future, the way things are developing, that uh, if you had a, if you had that piece of land that you could put a, a small solar farm in, and not, not knowing anything about how many yeah. panels it takes to power those five houses at what level, I would just definitely have to be a separate conversation. Okay, once, once all right. That ever is proposed. All right, thank you. We don't need any uh, protection in there. Let's say somebody's house like backs up to a major artery, seventy three, and they put a freestanding one facing the road or something like that. That shouldn't be by right, correct? Are you referring to a, um, a major solar facility? No, like a minor, somebody lives on two acres and they back up to Beatty's Ford Road and they decide to put one in their side yard. Could you specifically say it not would, permitted in the front yard? Yeah, so if someone was to permit one in the side or the, the rear of the yard, it would have to comply with all accessory structure um, requirements. Which there's something in there that says five feet in the, the rear and side yard from the, the property line. But like, I'm worried about glare facing the road or something like that, the orientation of the freestanding. If it's not on the roof, right, it's a little bit lower to the ground, that's a problem. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of a scenario with, where that would occur because okay. most freestanding would be at least five feet off the ground. Um, okay. But that is something, you know, we. And 
Chris, while you bring it up, I, I think, and don't, I'm, I don't know about the technology, but I feel like when we've talked about this before over the last couple of years, uh, glare has come up, and then I think we discussed it as well with, yeah. So I, I don't know though. No, I've not. Under, when, when we had uh, minor solar facilities come in for special use requirements, um, they did have to prove that it was not going to provide glare. Um, so I do believe the technology is out there that most of these don't have a high amount of glare. All right, thank you. Any other questions for staff? No? I'll take a motion. I have a motion. We have another arm wrestle. Oh. Apparently. It's going to be busy after the meeting. In considering the proposed amendment, TA 23-04, the Planning Board recommends approval based on the amendment being consistent with EOS 9.1 of the Huntersville 2040 Community Plan. It is reasonable and in the public interest to amend the zoning ordinance because it will encourage the use of solar and clarify language regarding the use of residential solar panels. Second. All right, we got a motion, we got a second. Any discussion? I guess I just want to make a general comment to the town. I mean, I guess I envision these freestanding ones, you know, it gets super popular and people are like, yeah, I live on, you know, enough property, I'm just going to put it beside my house, right? And then you're driving down and you're seeing them every fifth house or something. I don't know if that's the look that we want. I mean, I'd like to, you know, make sure that they're on the roof. I don't want to like a buy right, hey, I can put this in my side yard like a old satellite dish, right? Is what I'm kind of envision everybody having in 20 years. So my only comment on that is that it's so cost prohibitive. Yeah. Honestly, what you make from the energy company doesn't even cover what it costs mm -hmm. to, to put them up. Right now. Right. Yeah. We're a long <laughs> way off from that technology yeah. being affordable. And, and just to comment, I, I would point out that if you live in a if you live in a community a subdivision that has a HOA, that HOA can have rules that may prevent or put conditions on you using solar panels. The town has nothing to do with that. That's something you have to do as a citizen. You have to deal with individually. This is just a town uh, town position. Okay, if no other discussion, let's take a vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, that passes eight to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, there was actually something that I had wanted to read regarding the 2040 plan before we started the agenda and I forgot, so I blew it, I'm sorry. Um, the I have, of course, on what we're about to talk about, we've received plenty of emails, and there's been a lot of correspondence. The, the 2040 community plan and its purpose, what can be done, what cannot be done, that's come up numerous times in the conversations. Um, and, and so I just, I guess, wanted to set or reset the understanding of, of what it truly is. It, First off, it is required, okay? One of the questions that I received was basically that it, it doesn't hold merit because of how it comes together and so forth. North Carolina statutes actually require towns to have these things. Um, and so in fact, North Carolina statute 160D article five, so in section 501A, under the requirements for zoning, it says, as a condition of adopting and applying zoning regulations under this chapter, a local government shall adopt and reasonably maintain a comprehensive plan or land use plan. Section 501, subsection A, or sorry, 501A, subsection one for plans, it says a comprehensive plan sets forth goals, policies, and programs intended to guide the present and future physical, social, economic development of the jurisdiction. 
Land use plan uses text and maps to designate the future use or reuse of the land. And a comprehensive land use plan is intended to guide coordinated, efficient, and orderly development within the planning and development regulation jurisdiction based on the analysis of present and future needs. So it states that it is required and it is a guide. Further, in Section 501C, in terms of the adoption of the plans, the plan shall be adopted by the governing board with the advice and consultation of the planning board. Adoption and amendment of a comprehensive or land use plan is a legislative decision and shall follow the process mandated for zoning text amendments set by General Statute 160D-601. So plans adopted under this chapter shall be advisory in nature without independent regulatory effect. Plans adopted under this chapter shall be considered by the planning board and governing board when considering proposed amendments to zoning regulations as required by 160D-604 and 160D-605. And if a plan is deemed amended by General Statute 160D-605 by virtue of adoption of a zoning amendment that is inconsistent with the plan, that amendment shall be noted in the plan. In other words, it is absolutely required by state law, but it is also absolutely a guide and a tool. It, it in and of itself is not law, rule, requirement. And if it is to be modified, not the plan itself, but if the adoption is inconsistent with that plan, that has to be included in part of the motion. So I wanted to show both sides of that um, because that was coming up quite a bit. Um, but from that, it's time for public comments. You want to um, follow on to that question? A yeah. Legal, legal? Yeah, Jacob, a question. A follow on to that. If uh, emphasis here, the 2040 plan is a guide. It is the guide. We'll put it that way. It is the guide for the town and development. But if, uh, let's say, the town, when the town board deviates from the 2040 plan, um, is that considered an amendment? Yes. If, as I think it was the last part um, that Chairman Snipe mentioned, uh, if a plan is deemed amended by 605 by virtue of adoption of a zoning amendment that is inconsistent with the plan, the amendment shall be noted in the plan. So if something passes that is inconsistent, then that is now just amendment of that plan. They amend the town board with their, with their approval vote, correct. amend the 2040 plan. We can recommend that, correct? We can't amend it. We can recommend it. Recommend to the town board that they amend correct. the 2040 plan. Too many amends in there, but <laughs> all right, thank you. No problem. Um, so public comments, uh, this is another thing I wanted to mention. Uh, so we've discussed this topic in various forms a few times now. And uh, every time folks have been reminded as to how to act. And uh, for some reason, we're not quite nailing it. Um, the expectation, at least of us, of those that sit in our gallery is that you are sitting there. The, the public comments, it would be like as we all learned when we were younger to raise our hand. The podium is the opportunity to raise your hand and say, and we accept anyone to come up there and they get their three minutes and everyone will get their three minutes today or we have someone that's gonna have six because someone else has deferred their time. That's the opportunity and that's when we wanna hear from you and if someone feels strongly enough to step up there, then we want to be able to listen to them as well. Okay, so this isn't, this isn't one of those like the end of act one of a play at the Blumenthal or something where then we cheer because it was so moving. So I don't know why we have to keep talking about this, whatever, but that's an expectation. So I'd love to set a clean slate, have a casual meeting like we try and do, at least on the planning board. I want to set a great example uh, we have a young person that continues to attend, and I love to see that, but I would love her to see us all, you know, act somewhat close to what our driver's license says. So with that, if we could, let's, let's just get at it. Uh, we have one, two, three, 
if I'm counting correctly, we have five speakers. Um, because it is only five, I'm not going to, I know um, the last couple times we've called a few people up at the same time and you kind of line up and get ready. We don't have enough people, we don't have to worry about that. Um, so we will just go one at a time, but number one, Bob Bayer. And Bob, it says here you got six minutes coming your way and Scott Sittler, Scott where? And that you donated your three, if you will. Perfect. Bob, I think you know the drill by now. Go ahead, name and address for public record, and then I got my timer right here. You got six minutes, sir. Yeah, I don't need six minutes. Just uh, I appreciate you listening to me. My name is Bob Bear. I'm a 23-year resident of the Northstone subdivision on Lavenham Road. Um, one of the most recent uh, Freedom of Information Act emails that came out, you know, where it was to Commissioner Boone, and you know. Our friend called us, you know, the 50 Facebook idiots. Well, my name's Bob, and I'm a Facebook idiot. It's kind of our only, it's my only, you know, voice. I don't know how else to, like, make our, our wishes or our concerns known. Um, you know, I'm not going to get down and, and trade insults with anybody, but I have to tell you that the string of emails that have come out recently to commissioners and to people on the planning board where this gentleman doesn't like urge you to do things, he tells you to do things, you know, it makes us all wonder who runs the town. I mean, if this guy can just tell anybody in this room and how many times have we, we've heard him get up here and say, this is the best use for this property. In whose opinion? That's his opinion. I, I don't want to live next to a a hotel and conference center. Look at exit 18. Look at the mess down there. That's only seven miles from exit 25. They're going to allow that to happen right there in that nice rural property. Look at the beautiful properties that have been built around there already. Look at the horse, the equestrian houses at the corner of Rama Church in 73. The beautiful homes being built in Bellary on off of McCord. The plantation pavilion estates at the corner of Hiawassee and Huntersville Concord Road. Those are all gorgeous subdivisions with nice big lots. They have beautiful backyard in-ground pools. Let that land have some dignity. Do, build something that everyone would be proud to live next to. Don't let them take that land and destroy it and put up a circus. He talks about the exclu how exclusive it is with the memberships. Correct me if I'm wrong, the only thing the membership gives you is the use of the cement pond, right? The hotel, the conference center, the shops, the walking areas, that's all wide open to the public. You're going to allow all these transient people to come within a mile or two of our thousand home peaceful subdivision. It's not even that far from River Run. I mean, to let that kind of a development go in that space instead of a beautiful equestrian neighborhood, big lot subdivisions, big estate homes. He claims that people don't want big yards. You look at the homes that are being built off of McCord Road, those are million and a half dollar homes. Every one of those homes has a beautiful in-ground pool, a hot tub, a big entertainment area. His plan doesn't show room for any of that stuff. There's an alley behind your house. You're going to buy a million dollar house and you can't put in a swimming pool? And there are only 40 foot lots? I mean, that is so far away from what the original intention of the 2040 plan is. And I know it's only a guide, but to go from rural to highway commercial and put in a conference center and a hotel, I mean, come on, that's in our, that's in our backyard. You know, that plan, this, this 2040 plan, most of you guys were on this planning board when you enacted this. That's only 36 months ago. It's, it's changed so much that it's, it's time to throw it out the window. You guys spent a year on this thing. What's the purpose say? The 2040 community plan is meant to establish a framework for growth and development while maintaining the character and the livability of the town that Huntersville residents hold so dear. That's right, we hold that dear. And having a hotel and conference center in my backyard is not maintaining the liv livability, in my opinion.
There no traffic impact study? You're going to allow it. Is this the first time that anybody's ever been allowed to do the traffic impact analysis after the zoning has been changed? Does that make sense to anybody? Is that as backward as it gets? I mean, there's even issues at Burkdale Village. There's two commissioners that voted to allow a 110-foot hotel on a property that's zoned for 48 feet. I mean, we're, we're, everyone, everyone in town is getting a little nervous that there's nothing that won't get rubber stamped in this town. Look at Rama Church. They've pretty much clear cut it from North Stone to Hiawassee. Huge tracts of trees and acreage. And no, no tree saving, or they take one little sliver and leave all those trees, and that counts as the tree save for the whole thing so they can bring in the D9 dozers and clear the whole thing because it's cheaper for the developers. 40 and 50 foot lots in that beautiful property. That's, that's rural to everybody in here. Like I say, give that land some dignity. Make somebody build something nice in there. Don't let a circus come in here. We don't want to live next to a circus, a hotel and a conference center. You want to build a pond instead of a golf course? Go ahead, no one cares. But I don't want a conference center in a hotel that's bringing in transient people by the thousands a mile down the street from us. Please, just, I mean, at least, at least consider the, what the plan was intended to do. I know it's not the law. I know it's only an intended guide. But at least try to stick somewhat to it. A hotel and conference center is nowhere in, there's, there's 16 hotels already between exit 23, 25, and 28. But apparently, we desperately need another one out in the middle of the country. Thank you. Thanks, sir. All right, next up, Mildred. Mildred Peranich. Did I say that correctly? Gold star for me. Mildred, name and address for the public record, and then you get three minutes. Yes. My name is Mildred Poranich, and I live at 12824 Westmoreland Road in Huntersville, North Carolina, 28078, for the past 20 years of my life. I strongly oppose the Crystal Lagoon development in all aspects about this whole project. I do not, and I wrote this in bold letters, want to look out my front windows and my front door to see apartments and townhouses. If I wanted to look at hotels, convention centers, apartments, townhouses, with completely noisy environment 24-7, my family and I would have purchased a home in the city of Charlotte. We actually had that option when we moved here, and we declined. I have done much research, and we do not have the infrastructure to support this huge project. I do my research. C.S. Lewis quoted, one of the most cowardly things ordinary people do is to shut their eyes to facts. After attending meetings and researching information about this project and those involved, I am very concerned about any board, for this matter, in Huntersville, but especially the Huntersville Board of Commissioners, ability to vote on this development objectively based on all of my in-depth research by myself with no swaying, no influence, but just because God gave me a brain and an education. I honestly question the board's ability to make an impartial decision based on the admitted relationship with the developer. I was at that meeting. According to the Town of Huntersville website, the developer was appointed or elected or whatever to the Huntersville Ordinance Advisory Board. And this is not just hearsay. I have a copy if you want it. I do my research. I follow what's going on in Huntersville. 
not only just on a board, which I understand people, I mean, we're all citizens. We can, we can volunteer on boards. We can be appointed to boards. But the Huntersville Ordinances Advisory Board, does, you know, look at, look at what that entails. Not only just a member, but a voting member. If you want the hard, well, so I gave that to you. Right there gives reason for, for us, or those of us who are paying attention and are not naive, cannot help but feel that there is a conflict of interest for the Board of Commissioners or anybody else involved in this petition to say that they would never be unbiased and, and for people to let their guard down is a little absurd. Ms. Pranich, your, your three minutes are up. Thank you. Can I just finish one little No, because I actually gave you enough time to finish that sentence. Well, so. I got my message. Oh. Thank you. That's OK. <laughs> All right, next up, Suzanne Villar. Ma'am, as you know, three minutes. Name and address for the public record. Good evening. I'm Suzanne Villar, and I live at 17130 Bridgeton Lane. I'd like to build on some comments made last week to our town commissioners, and my apologies ahead of time to Mr. Burton if I misunderstood or misstate any of his points. But years ago, Huntersville recognized a need to manage and organize the rapid development Huntersville was and continues to undergo. To that end, the town invested a great deal of time, energy, money, and citizen input to develop a well-thought-out 2040 plan. Huntersville was really smart to do this. Using Kiowa Island, South Carolina as an example of a beautiful community that also has a plan, Mr. Burton made the point that the town of Kiowa Island and its ARC have built a culture based on their plan and a conviction that they want their community to retain its beauty and personality, and if they want that, they must follow their guiding plan and only approve projects that honor the plan. He says landowners, developers, architects, residents, etc., all know what will be approved and what won't be approved. Even so, he says, Kiowa Island and its ARC say no a lot. But they don't care, because call it a guide or call it a plan, his point was that the results are their results, and the results speak for themselves. Anyone who's visited Kiowa Island knows this. I'd like to add that Huntersville recognize, uh, should recognize and respect our 2040 plan in the same vein. Uh, and they should uh, apply it equally to the approval or denial of any request, not just this one, but every request. If landowners and developers know what will be approved in advance, we'll have a better, smoother, and quicker process, and better projects will be the result. Allowing a developer to believe that a proposal can ignore the 2040 plan and come in with close to 60 problems cited is ludicrous and time-consuming for staff and, and commissioners. Everyone attached to the city in any capacity, staff, board member, commissioner, or mayor, must have the discipline to adhere to the 2040 plan that we've all already invested so much in. The cost to the town for ignoring the 2040 plan is steep and has played out repeatedly in recent years and includes angry neighbors, anger director, directed at developers, elected officials put in the uncomfortable spot of having to make a Solomon's decision which either way they go is gonna end up with some voters not liking them. They'd be protected from that if we adhered to the 2040 plan. There's, there's no reason to subject elected officials to that kind of stress. So if we wanna realize the result of a Huntersville that's a great place to live, work, and play, we have to have the discipline needed to follow the 2040 plan that was designed with that objective in mind. Please reject this proposal. Thank you, Ms. Villar. Next up is Jennifer Hunt. Jennifer, please state your name and address for the public record, and then you get three minutes. Okay. Uh, Jennifer Hunt, 12838 Levens Hall Road. 
As we continue to weigh the impacts of the Laguna Bay project, there are several points that stick with me. The first issue is one of resource allocation. In order to accommodate the Laguna Bay project, we are changing the zoning from low density to high density. The result of the zoning change means less tree save and mitigation. Being invested in our local environment might feel like a drop in the collective environmental bucket, but it's something that we can affect and change. The neighboring schools will be strained by the influx of additional students, which facilitates overcrowding. The sewer and water infrastructure will need to be updated. This becomes an issue of capacity and an important question for the town. Is this how we want to allocate our resources? Is this the right project for Huntersville right now? The second point is about the chemicals being used to keep the lagoon water crystal clear. The developer last said that he would not be using the molecular film technology, and he spoke about the mechanical process of keeping the water clean, but what is the chemical process of keeping the water clean? I reached out to Crystal Lagoons to ask them questions about the chemicals used, and they told me they have numerous studies and certifications regarding their technology. When I asked to see the studies and certifications, they told me I needed to sign an NDA. There is a Crystal Lagoon in Texas, so why are the results of the studies not available? We deserve to know what chemicals are going back into our water system. The final point is regarding affordable housing. While we are becoming an increasingly affluent community, we need to consider what this is costing us. The Laguna development would add over 1,000 homes, with only 20 being affordable housing. While some citizens may be pleased to hear that our values are increasing, we need to keep in mind the service professionals like teachers, EMTs, and police officers. Their salaries do not increase at the same rate that our home values increase. In other words, by continuing to boost our home values, we will make it difficult for a family of service professionals to live in the town they serve. And that includes my husband and myself. Again, we need to pause and carefully consider if this project is right for us. We need to consider a variety of factors with long-term implications. We know the project isn't consistent with the 2040 plan. We know that more than 5,300 citizens have signed a petition against this development. With all of our affluence, we can afford to be choosier about how we allocate our resources and engage in projects that help the collective good. I'm asking that you reject this project. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our final speaker is Melanie Griffin. Hey there. Name and address course for the public record, and then you get three minutes. Hi, I'm Melanie Griffin. I live at 12900 West Merlin Road in Huntersville. Um, I now speak at all of these, I think. Um, like everyone else has touched on, my main concern, obviously, and I understand that it's not a law, but I do understand that it's guidelines that were helped Put in place to help us make good decisions that benefit the community as a whole. Um, I'm just not really sure with the 2040 plan how we can justify going from the most rural zoning to zoning that didn't even have things approved at Burkdale, which is an already designated shopping center, an already designated commercial area. Um, not only is changing the zoning to the zoning that he wants not really good enough because of all of the special amendments that have then been asked for on top of that zoning. And my question to that is if anything that is approved project-wise becomes an amendment to the 2040 plan that I'm not really sure where you would ever be able to draw the line with special amendments and special zoning and basically just a, a free-for-all. And honestly, it makes me nervous. The whole community kind of seems like a free-for-all with luxury housing, apartments, townhomes, condominiums, shopping center, uh, restaurants, hotel, convention center. Um, and when asked about that, it doesn't seem like there are any good responses other than it's going to be great and everybody loves it. And there seems to be an answer for everything that gets asked. Um, the social media presence has been so strong, and it is, I, I hate that it has gotten so divisive and so hateful. Uh, it's been very hateful on both sides. Um, a lot of things are being put out and then deleted, and 
it seems as though anytime someone's opinion differs from the developers, we're treated as though we're just not intelligent or we're thinking with our emotions or we're selfish and not thinking about the community. Um, and then the developer is allowed to be passionate. So I am emotional and selfish and he is passionate. Um, I'm just not really sure that, the, like everyone else has said, the, the basis for something that would change the plan that we know this much and the zoning this much should just be up to one man that can say, I think it's gonna be great. And a luxury hotel that we have to have is going to be a Margaritaville hotel? I don't know. So anyways, thank you very much. Thank you for being on the board. I, this, this is a lot for you guys. <laughs> wow. So thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Uh, that does it for public comments. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Mr. Pete, before you get started, I just want to point out what was maybe obvious. We kind of nailed that. So I'm glad our meeting now does not look like the others. That makes me a little bit happier. So uh, with that, thank you for uh, what you did, what you said. Sir, let me read this off to, to get you going. Agenda item 4C, consider recommendation on petition R23-05, Laguna Bay Beach Club, a request by Bipart Development, LLC, to rezone approximately 263 acres generally located north and south of NC73, South Mays Road, east of Westmoreland Road, north of McCord Road, and west of Black Farm Road from existing rural and transitional residential to excuse me, traditional neighborhood development conditional district, a neighborhood residential conditional district, and highway commercial conditional district for mixed use development consisting of approximately 1,183 residential units that's comprised of 250 single family, 201 townhomes, 432 apartment units, and 300 condominium units. It's also 210,000 square feet of retail, 200 hotel rooms, 36,000 square feet of convention center space, and a 41.16 acre commercial lagoon. Mr. Pete. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I want to enter the uh, staff report into the record. Um, I want to enter into the record the document that was at your dais this evening. Um, the applicant handed out these sheets, which are really no more than the five area breakdowns, but it is illustrating the an increased buffer um, throughout the project. Now, this was just given to us this evening, so uh, we don't have a whole lot to say to it, and the applicant, uh, Mr. Palillo, can expand on it uh, when he has his uh, presentation but I want to put that into the record. Um, I also wanted to start out by touching on the um, item in red at the top of the staff report for tonight's meeting and just make sure that everyone understands that um, the latest version, the fourth version of the plan that, that we have been working from um, was updated and, and submitted to us um, the day after um, the continued public hearing, which was last Wednesday. So it was sent out to you in your packet but as you may or may not be familiar, we, we have a time period for the review agencies, everyone involved, to do their reviews. And so that was not possible to have that review done on the day that the packet goes out to you. So as a complete review of the plan that we currently have in hand, that is still not complete. Um, we, we have a cursory understanding of some of the things that have changed. So we're not going to be able to elaborate too much on some of those elements. Um, but what I thought I would do tonight is just refresh the planning board on some of the larger elements that are essentially unchanged. Um, they go back to the public hearing on June the 5th, and we can kind of go through that if you'd like in more detail or less. Um, I'm just going to touch on a few points and then um, sort of let the planning board guide how you want to go. And you, if you want to take a, a, an item or two off of that large list of concerns in the staff report, um, we could perhaps talk through that. Um, the applicant may be able to speak to maybe the way that they're addressing it, uh, but we're, staff is just not going to be able to point by point elaborate completely. Does that make sense? 
So the star on the screen, uh, you can see where the property is located. I don't think we need to belabor too much of this. I um, just wanted to show you again to make sure everyone understands the current zoning, um, where the TR and the uh, rural and the green is located in the project. Um, the, uh, the project would, uh, the TR would be 173 acres and that would handle 259 single family homes by right. Uh, the rural would be at 90 acres and it would um, hold 81 single family homes. And again, that's by right and that's you know, maximizing open space and such. Um, <clears throat> I just mentioned that just a second ago. So that was a total number, uh, 340 units by right. Um, here is the site plan, and again, this has some age to it. It is not the fourth version that, um, that you have before you. Uh, but generally speaking, give or take a couple of units, because I understand that the latest version perhaps is, has adjusted a few counts. Um, 180 townhomes north of 73, 320 apartments north of 73. Um, as mentioned, 112 apartments, 200 hotel rooms, 36,000 square foot convention center, 210 square foot, 100,000, hmm, start again, 210 100,000 square feet of retail um, over in uh, the, the east side. Uh, the lagoon is around 48 acres, and it would have multiple buildings to it. There'd be a large clubhouse, a lot of ancillary buildings, dining, uh, recreation, that type of thing. Uh, 250 single family dwellings, and um, that is in both parts. So you can see the running total there on the left. Uh, wanted to show you that some of the projects that are surrounding this, you can see the North Creek Village uh, conditional district plan that sort of evolved in two pieces on the east. Uh, Symphony Park would be one on the west, and then uh, the likes of Willowbrook, um, North Stone that have been there for quite some time, and then some newer developments along McCord. Um, <clears throat> this is what the zoning would look like if the proposal is successful. You would have uh, the traditional neighborhood development, urban, um, north of 73, uh, highway commercial, and then NR. Now, remember, this entire project is billed as a mixed-use walkable community, pedestrian-friendly. Um, the TNDU definitely has very specific requirements that are outlined in the ordinance. Um, highway commercial has a, has a broad use, and um, none of the proposed, or none of the uses in the highway commercial zone um, <clears throat> are looking to be restricted. So they would all be there um, under uh, some capacity. And then a neighborhood residential is just our um, highest density residential, if you will. Uh, these were the two sections of the um, community plan in terms of why we have that. And um, the chairman went over that at the beginning of the meeting, so I'm not going to belabor that. Um, this is the future land use map from the 2040 plan. And you can see where it is located, um, zooming in. It's got three different components. You have a rural conservation there on the eastern side where the highway commercial is proposed. Uh, you have the residential edge, uh, which is sort of the middle or the heart of it where the lagoon would be, a lot of the apartments and townhomes, and then some of the single family. Actually, no, that's not true. Um, a little bit of the single family. And then there would be the moderate density on the west side. <clears throat> and that is where you get into, say, one to three units per acre in the, in the future land use plan. Here is those three uh, districts that I just mentioned overlaying the plans dimensions, so you can kind of see how that lines up um, in, in a larger sense. Um, this is, if approved, this is what the land use plan designations would look like. So they're in the middle where the lagoon, the, the mixed, the commercial, and the apartments and townhomes would be. There would be the creation of a mixed use center is what is being proposed. And then down below, you would really have that moderate density residential that I referenced a minute ago one to three units per acre is um, sort of what that's shooting for. <clears throat> so if that were to be in play, what would that do? What would the adjoining property impacts be? Um, the introduction of these, the changing of those future land use patterns. Um, you've got land that is now adjacent to those uses and those, those designations that they were not before. So that's a, that's a future impact, that's a, that's a short term impact um, that, that you're changing the pattern or the development pattern that is, that is being um, desired through the plan. So um, if, the, if, if we were to take a step back and say what would be something that would help, um, that would look at development opportunity in this particular area, I think it would be to introduce some moderate density and some residential edge. Um, what that would look like is changing, you can see, that rural area in the green could go away, and the middle um, could be expanded to that. 
Um, and then you would see down at the bottom the moderate density of the residential edge. Now, those particular elements are not going to facilitate the lagoon project as it is. What we're representing here is what the 2040 plan would like to see and what some of the developments that we have seen throughout town are looking to do and what could be appropriate in this location, again, with a fully vetted plan that would have to follow a lot of the ordinance requirements. Uh, but just to be clear, this type of thing, this type of modification, that's something that staff would be able to support, is not something that will facilitate this particular plan. Um, I don't need to belabor 73. I think we're all aware the, the, the expansion and the ch uh, upgrades are coming. Um, this is from the corridor plan. And really, all that I want to point out is where you see the big red arrow. That just indicates that it's a very low density, a lot of open space preservation, that type of thing in this area. And that is what DOT is used to create their plans and, and others. Um, it's been referenced about Charlotte Water in their plans for sewer capacity. They've re referenced our documents, as well as any other town's documents in the, in the basins that they serve. Um, just kind of wanted to give you a quick snapshot of density. Again, this is based on the public hearing. Uh, if there have been, if there has been a drop in the unit count since the new plans, that would not be reflected on here. But I don't think it's going to move the needle terribly. So you can see 5.3 units an acre in the townhomes, 13 units per acre in the apartments, um, six and a half units over in the retail area in the east, and then the residential comes out at two and a half. So you can see what uh, the North Creek development to the east at the intersection, and by the way, the circle that you see there on the right, uh, that encompasses a quarter mile um, activity center. Um, that is where intensification at the crossroad of two thoroughfares, which would be Davidson Concord Road and 73, is desired, encouraged, and um, that project went through a lot of um, review to, to try to get it. Uh, but you can see that the 2.2, 4.9, 17, that represents an apartment complex, those are all well within the core, the middle of that activity center. Um, and as you get out of it, you can see that the density drops pretty precipitously, 2.2, 1.5. So it's not necessarily matching the rural up against it, but it is matching the TR that is also near uh, in the vicinity. Uh, Willowbrook, 1.5. So again, you, you see that this, pro this area is low density. The, the plan is calling for low density. And if you're going to have an increase, I think North Creek is a, a good example. It is, it is moved in, it is transitioned, it is not at the edges. So uh, a lot of the staff report that you uh, have seen is, is talking about things like that. Um, the only other thing I really want to touch on before we can sort of go with questions is just the, uh, I did want to touch on the fact that the TIA, there is a note um, in the current plan, and I'm, I'm going to let Mr. Palillo expand on it. Um, the ordinance requires a TIA. This particular project is asking for a modification. They would not like to turn in a TIA. The note in the plan that they would propose is saying that they will do whatever DOT needs and that the town board would kind of get another review of it and they per perhaps could add additional requirements to that. That's completely unprecedented in the fact of what the note's indicating as well as not having the TIA. Um, so we, we certainly, as the staff report indicates, have a lot of questions. Um, about something like that and what that would mean going forward as well as specifically. Um, with that, um, any questions that you already have or already had from the public hearing that we can talk about in terms of what this report was getting to? Um, again, not so much maybe what the plan is uh, adjusting for, but what we're looking, what we were meaning rather in our comments. I've heard a lot about the buffer, and I just want to clear everything up. When the developer submitted, the buffer requirement was what, and is he meeting that? So you have to look at two things and keep them very clear. The, the zoning ordinance has a requirement, okay, that if you do something by right, no matter what zone you're in, there's a, there's a buffer requirement. When this was submitted, and at the beginning of March, it was 20 feet undisturbed. Two weeks after that submittal, the town board recognized that as they have now made subdivisions a, a staff level review, they needed to make sure that all the different types of developments that they've been looking at are sort of addressed in the best way they could. So they changed it from 40 feet, you know, um, a buffer that's required every time. 
that is what the ordinance is looking for this is a rezoning this is a request to look at a project that is doing something that you have to evaluate 360 and say what buffers are appropriate for what they're looking to do so yes you begin at what the ordinance is going to do and then you go from there to say what's appropriate what's going to facilitate it not every project that comes in as a cd rezoning is is pushing the envelope if you will and maybe you don't need anything more um, all of you will remember the uh, the hamlet project on 115 down near plum creek that project was introducing 100% um, rental single family homes and townhomes, but not there. And Plum Creek worked with the development and they got a 50 foot buffer with a berm and a wall, a fence rather, excuse me. So the point is not that that's the magical buffer, but that they worked through how to transition from this particular use to this particular use. And so I hope I haven't over explained it, but you do have an ordinance requirement, but then you have the merits of the plans requirement. I shouldn't say requirement, uh, recommendation. That's perfect. And going back to the Plum Creek example, is the connection there or is it not there? I've, I've heard both sides of that. Like, we don't want the connection the and we street. want the connection. Yeah, the stub. The public stub street that does exist today will not be physically connected. It will be built from Hamlet and it will be gated. Uh, in, th in this one. Oh, in this one? Yeah, Willow. The, the, uh, the connection to Willowbrook is still there. It's still there. Yes. Okay. Question I'll, I'll follow on to that same question, and, and then, Stephen, you, you, you guys go. But the bottom line is the zoning ordinance, the, the applicant is only required, I'm just saying, some places I know he has 80 foot requirements, 70, correct? Uh, buffer, there's there are different areas, but the 20 foot buffer, that's all the zoning ordinance requires. And so, and in fact, I mean, the way I look at it, the planning department is asking the applicant to make a, modifi a, a, a zoning ordinance modification to increase it for, uh, from 20 to make it more. I understand normally we come in here, we, we look at if there's a subdivision and we look at the density of the project, we may ask the applicant, would you consider would you consider increasing that buffer? And normally, they will increase it to some point. I think that's what happened at Plum Creek uh, to the hamlet at Huntersville. Uh, but but I, I'm, the zoning ordinance for him is 20. If he does any more, he's doing that out of, out of pocket. Well, a conditional district rezoning is just that. It's a, it's a list of conditions that both the town and the applicant have agreed to. What staff is offering up as our recommendation is if you're going to do a single family or a two-story home and right across the street from it is a proposed 13 unit an acre four-story apartment building separated by 20 feet we would not find that acceptable in the spirit of the ordinance and in the 2040 plan but then again the zoning ordinance says he the applicant only has to put a 20 foot in regardless of whatever else because if it was the other way around the town is you know. Sure, if this was a by right development, that's what they'd be expected to do, but this is completely um, con negotiable. Oh, along those lines, David, um, can you talk about the buffering of the North Creek Village development that was approved at the node and what buffers were negotiated and finalized there? For North Creek, um, yes, you had, uh, I think the smallest was 40 feet. Um, that was down in the south part where it's 1.5 units per acre. Um, as you move to the 1.7, they became 50 feet. Um, <clears throat> I will state in the apartment situation, they actually were 200 feet, but that was an anomaly because there was a creek and they basically took all of the adjoining property and just took it all the way to the edge of the creek. So it's, it's a 200 foot buffer, very, very adequate, obviously. Um, that, that would not be a, a typical situation. But to answer your question, that's what it ended up being. Mr. Pete, question about 2040 plan and activity center versus mixed use. So the North Creek Village is a activity center, correct? In the 2040 plan is denoted as an activity center, right? Yes. And where I'm going with this is this project is relatively close in proximity to that activity center. Talk to me the difference about what is perceived as an activity center versus a mixed use node. Obviously, there is a difference, and I just want to 
get my arms around what those would be. Well, I'm going to I'll let Brian kind of scan to see if there is some specific language, but the activity center and, and the, well, you're asking about the difference between the, the, the terms. Yeah, where I'm going with this is, let's say if the 2040 plan said that this North Creek Village area should be mixed use, how I'm trying to reconcile the proximity to that node with this development. Okay, and I know so, they're very different. Sure. The, so the mixed use center um, contained vertical mixed uh, use along key frontages. New development includes wide sidewalks, buildings are close to the street with high level transparency. Parking is located in the rear. A mix of housing is allowed, including urban options throughout apartments, townhomes, cottages. Downtown has specific requirements for, well, it doesn't apply, that's for downtown. The activity center is a little bit, it's building on that. Um, planned activity center includes a mix of non-residential and residential uses, usually located at key intersections of major thoroughfares. Um, new non-residential units are limited in scale and overall footprint, generally less than 40,000 square feet of non-residential. Residential uses include a mix of housing types centered around shopping services or civic uses. Residential uses transition to lower gross density with more open space away from the activity center. So you're, you're looking at um, you know, where those thoroughfares are happening, out on Beatty's Ford, out on Poplar Tent, wherever that case may be, it, you're, you're setting it up, you're varying, but you don't go very far with it. Um, whereas, say, uh, Burkdale would be more on the mixed. And obviously, the mixed use is a much more intensified. OK, that's. Can you please go back to um, the by right numbers, please? So what what would they be able to build by right? 340 single family homes. And we're talking about 1,000, 1,100, OK. All right, thank you. A follow-up question, a follow-up uh, to what the activity center Scott was talking about. Um, I take it the circle over centered with the CD in it is the activity center. But that's just a point on the map. Really, it's, this, it's the area. It's not because if you looked at that activity center, it's uh, 0.8 miles north and south and a half a mile wide. And it's a good portion of it, well, a third of it is outside the circle. So the circle is really not, it's just kind of a point on the map that tells you that's where an activity center goes, correct? Well, the intention would be that you would center it on the two thoroughfares that are intersecting. But because north of the intersection is not our jurisdiction, right. it's, it's brought down. But the circle itself just represents that quarter mile wall. Right. So, I, I mean, I, I look at this and I, I hear all the arguments and I, I see, but I, I look at the location of this project and the location of the activity node and the major intersection that will happen there someday. Uh, that, that's point, if you, if you went 0.8 miles from the intersection and pulled it over, it'd probably go over to about the lagoon in that direction. That's a north-south 0.8 miles. If you took the 0.8 miles out and drew a circle for the activity center in that area. So it's, it's not de necessarily defined just within that site. And I know the purpose of an activity center. This may end up being more. And I, I have things to say about that in discussion. But I, I'm just trying to clarify, clarify that. Because if you went back and look at the other map at Poplar Tent Road, uh, the the size of your circles, the size of the activity center, is that an employment hub or an activity center out at Poplar Tent Road and 73? You showed on the map earlier. I believe that's mixed use. And I don't think there's much commercial on the Charlotte, the Huntersville side of that road. It's all on the Concord side. It's, it's I mean, it's more than half. It's a bigger circle, so I, I mean, so I, I really don't pay attention to the to the circle. I pay attention to the area and its potential uses. So, and but I'll I'll save some of that. I have items for discussion. This is not discussion. That was a question. I have a uh, like Frank. I have some items in the discussion, but I did want to talk about 
the TIA real quick. Okay. Um, I'd heard in the public hearings that, that the town is not going to be involved in the review or, or requirements for any transportation improvements. Is that correct or did I hear that wrong? It's all been, um, uh, I guess, sent to NCDOT. It would be sent to NCDOT for their recommendations and not the town's. That's right. The, the roads that are impacted by this project are DOT roads, and they would have all say on what's going to happen there. Uh, so the town looked at it through its normal processes and realized that uh, they were essentially all DOT. So we have um, given that review over to DOT. And this may be hypothetical and may not be appropriate, but if does the town, after DOT says, okay, we've got four intersections to improve or whatever that is, does the town say, no, we want five? Or, or does that go against what you just said well, generally, there's an acceptance of what DOC says. Right. Um, th there could be a discussion, if you will, but no, we don't kind of say that's not right or, or anything like that. Um, you know, they, they, they come through with their criteria and their improvements, and, and they're generally uh, significant, if you will. Yeah, so, so when the TIA is presented, I mean, it's DOT and it's bound to this project based on, you know, the phasing or whatever that would happen to be. So I guess what I'm getting at is you are, this project is committed to the TIA because, because it's, uh, you could not build it without that at some point. It's just a timing issue, right? Well, I think the importance here is um, that the board understands the totality of the improvements that go along or necessitated by the, an approval. If you rezone this property at this intensity, what's required to make it happen? What will DOT expect? Mm -hmm. Maybe the board doesn't think it's enough. Now they may not be able to do anything about that, except for the fact that they control the rezoning. Okay. So that's a that's a very important piece of information that um, is not, is, as far as we're aware, has always been considered as part of these projects. Again, it does not mean that the list is big or long or super expensive. It's just understood. Right. Okay. I'll save some of this for discussion as well. Any other questions for staff? I, a couple of the a couple of the specific items on the issues. Um, Willowbrook subdivision. Um, I think I've heard. Uh, It, there are concerns from Willowbrook, two, specifically two items. One is the buffer. And the original plan, it called for a 20-foot buffer between Willowbrook and the density on the Laguna side. Correct. All right. As, as, and I know this is probably a question for the applicant. Have, have you discussed that with the applicant? Has he increased that buffer? We, we understand that there is a, a, an increase that has been handed out tonight. Um, he can speak to the specifics of okay. what it applies there. All right. The next question is the stub connector. Mm -hmm. uh, is that stub connector, will, it, will there still be a connection to Laguna and Willowbrook? The applicant is proposing to do it per the policies of the town. Mm -hmm. We are recommending that it happen, as we do with every development. Will it be, yeah, so we don't, we don't decide that here. This is town board stuff we're talking right now. But uh, would it be... Gate with the gated or as it is. You do not the town the planning staff does not advocate gating, correct? correct. All right. So as it, as it stands, the town policy, the zoning ordinance says uh, he's required to make the connection unless the town board makes a decision otherwise. It's a public street out there today, hundred percent and stuff. I'm, I'm just saying that's not in our purview unless it, unless the town board decides to do something with it. Um, Another item I, I would, would it's ask. It's in the recommendation, though, right? Sure. Yeah. Of the. What, to connect? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Connect. Clarify? Yeah, we could send a recommendation to connect or not connect, correct? Okay. All right. I'm, I'm sorry, Chris. Thank you. What else was I going to say? Uh, some of the other items, one of the things I would, well, this, this is probably more for the applicant that I, I would point out and request something from, from him. 
All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, more for staff? Good. Okay, Mr. Pete, thank you for the moment. Um, Mr. Palillo, if you would, uh, name and address, of course. You have up to 15 minutes to present. Um, and then, of course, we'll, I'm sure, have questions for you as well, sir. Okay. Um, real quickly, that sheet that you were given is a 40 foot buffer now. So we did 20 foot required. Your name and address first. Oh, I'm sorry. General. Jake Palillo, 17532 Salview Drive, Cornelius, North Carolina. Um, the requirement is 20 feet. We've gone back, modified it. We have a 20 foot undisturbed per the code and we have a 20 foot disturbed and rebuilt and I'll show it to you in the uh, presentation here. So I'll try to go as quickly as possible. Um, the proposed project, you've already been up to speed on what it is. Uh, what I wanna point out right here is Highway 73 is a major commercial corridor. Um, when you see the Laguna Bay where it's located up here, uh, this parcel of land is the last large track of land along the 73 highway corridor that can be developed. This shows you 73, how it connects. It's 38 miles long. It connects 16, 77, and 85. Uh, we've got 485 to the, to the south. Uh, this is the 2040 plan right here. And what I wanted to point out as well on this is that the node up in this one area here, you notice this is a retail center. And retail centers typically need traffic and rooftops. So this retail center is surrounded by rural, which really doesn't support. Uh, and one of the other plans you saw currently right now, those little retailers trying to open up in here have all this rural area. So they don't have any density to support them. So that's kind of 101 in development. Rooftops and retail is what you need. I'm sorry, rooftop and traffic is what you need for a commercial district. Um, we've gone through over here the uh, different nodes and you'll see that they're on the outside of the community. Typically, when you put these nodes in, you put them in the center and you surround them with retail and other uses. So to be on the outside over here, especially number three, doesn't really serve the community of Huntersville because the core of Huntersville is in here. The main area of Huntersville, where you see this town center, is all in through this area. Then it goes into traditional and then it goes to rural. So our argument would be this area here along 73 should actually be all town center. This connects to the Davidson, Davidson Concord Rama Church. Uh, that's a major thoroughfare coming in. Um, the difference here is that we have one place to gather between Cornelius Davidson and Huntersville. Everyone from Cornelius and Davidson comes to Huntersville to shop, dine, and so our one place in town is Burkdale. You get a lot of complaints. You hear people saying that, you know, I don't go there because you can't get in. You can't get a seat at the restaurant. Laguna Bay is like Burkdale, but it adds some different features to it. So if you split the region in half, you'll see that all of these highlighted areas would have less travel distance to go to Laguna Bay than they would go to Burkdale. Fewer cars to Burkdale reduces the traffic at Burkdale. So less time on the road, less time uh, in the cars, less traffic. This one here shows you all these little circles are all little infills. So when we don't do a master plan community that has services and everything to support it, we do these little infills. These little infills right here were 1,867 dwellings that have been added here. Uh, with the exception of the apartments, these little communities of 127, 81, 42, 22, they don't have any amenities. They don't have any clubhouses, pools, they don't have anywhere to gather. So they then have to find a place, and the closest is join North Stone Country Club. North Stone already has a waiting list. So when you do these little shot infill projects without amenities, um, and you don't add any more areas for them to go shop and dine, it becomes a problem. The, uh, the reason what the traffic impact study is this, the reason that, that the town deferred it to NCDOT is because we have a massive amount of road projects approved, ready to start, and so they're either, so even Highway 73 is gonna start in 2026. But if you look at everything in green, those are all NCDOT projects. If you look at the orange, those are the town projects. So you have all of these massive projects taking place. So when you're going to go do a traffic study, 
it's hard to say how can you do a study based on roads that are under construction or being widened. Um, the traffic impact study, because the project is expensive, it's $80,000. Because the town said, hey, NCDOT, you do it. When NCDOT gives you a recommendation, you have to follow it. If the town adds recommendations, you can go back before the board and say, well, I don't agree with this or that. But So, the, so what we're saying is we, we don't want to risk the $80,000 because the project has to be rezoned. But we will go and do the traffic study. We'll bring the results back from NCDOT. We'll bring it back to the planning board. We'll bring it back to town staff, even though they said they don't want to add anything to it. If they see that they want to add something to it, we'll do it, and it'll, be, it'll become a condition. So we're going above and beyond what they said, just let NCD do it. We said we'll give it to NCDOT, and we'll bring it back to the town and to this board and to the town board. So Laguna Village is a more modern style of Burkdale. So what we do is we really take this road out and all of these restaurants and stuff on the lower level open out to these large courtyards. So it's more like the, the uh, European feel to where you have these big plazas, big gathering points, and that's these areas over here. And I'll show you some examples of, of what they look like. It's a large food halls of the new concept, so you bring young entrepreneurs in. Um, like Optimus Hall, a lot of these food courts, food halls, that's the new crave. Uh, these young chefs and stuff can go in, they get a 20 by 20 space, they can open up a place, and they can conduct their business. It gives everybody all sorts of food options. So if I like pizza, you like chicken, someone likes, everybody, you can go there with the family, you can all find something to eat, and you can gather in one of these, these areas to dine. So to have foods, mainly what's gonna be at the village is a lot of different foods. Um, retail is kind of dying. Uh, Burkdale doesn't have room for any more uh, restaurants because they don't have an adequate parking space. So there's a real need for that. The concept of the lagoon is the newest thing out. It's been out around in the U.S. around six years. Um, you're seeing there's 260 of these projects planned. It's an unbelievable lifestyle. If you ever had an opportunity to go to Florida and take a look at them, it's a lifestyle like no other. Uh, you have this huge body of water. Today, if this project was here, it would be full of people and families enjoying an unbelievable lifestyle. So the golf courses and stuff are kind of fading out and not as popular. So there's your regular swimming pool that you see at a, a normal uh, a community club. Some are bigger, some are smaller. There's Laguna Beach Club. That is the exact picture from one of the places. The cabanas, the sand, the kids playing. This will give you everything you can do. So you can't do this at a community pool. These are all the things that's at this beach club. So it's like a country club, a golf country club. Take the golf course out, put the lagoon in. Golf course is limited to what people like. Beach club, water, sand, everybody loves. From young kids to couples, adults, it's an amazing lifestyle. And this is truly what it is. So you know, three years from now, if this is approved, this is what you're gonna see in your community. They're up and coming, you're gonna see them all over the place, like you saw golf courses spring up. Um, I hope that you'd consider it here so we can be the first, instead of the one that we could have had it here, but it's somewhere else, and we have to go somewhere else and look at it. We have a trolley system that runs three mile radius to different clubhouses. It'll pick up people and bring them back to the Laguna Beach Club. So that's another way to keep traffic down, and it's more, economical for members. Uh, basically what it says here is, you know, we're bringing, now I've also offered the town board the ability to take out the hotel and the convention center if they want. I said, if you want, if you don't like those components of it, pull those things out and, and they didn't want to do that. So it creates $8 million in property tax. This was another thing important. When you're limited to the amount of development you can put in a town, you want to look at stuff that adds property tax value and adds additional tax values. So here's a property that's gonna create $800 million in property taxes, and it's gonna create over $8 million in sales tax, prepared food tax, and hotel tax. So those are the things that a town, when it says you wanna balance your residential to your commercial, because these are additional revenue dollars that you can bring in. Uh, 380 homes, 500 homes are not gonna bring that additional $8 million. Plus, it's not gonna give you the services you need. Uh, we, we've added 20 affordable housing units, which we said we'll do at the 30% of the 80%, and we'll give them a free membership, and we'll charge them no fees. All they have to do is that they food, they'll have to pay for food. We have four different housing types, townhouses, single-family homes, apartments, condos. 
Um, higher end homes, million dollar price points where they're gonna be at. Uh, we don't have a lot of volume of that. So you want houses that are paying double the medium home price because again, that's how you keep your property tax lower. When someone else is paying more, someone else doesn't, have it, so it balances out. Um, the other thing is we don't have condos. So we don't have a lot of condos. Condo market has come back in. So this project is master plan and it's filling a lot of the voids we don't have. So in the original plan, because we're putting this thing through, in all honesty, we're trying to get it as far away from the election because we don't want the project to be part of an election. We want it to be stand on its own. So we had 56 different requirements that were there. I've sent out an email showing what the, we, we've categorized it and we've gone through and we've changed every one of them. So we've shown here the different zones. Uh, here we've given all the block lengths. This shows you the chart. So we've submitted all that. This shows the 10 foot multi-purpose path, where it goes, how it runs throughout the community so it's a walkable community. Even people from uh, North Stone can get right on this path right here, 950 homes right here. Then you're right on that 10 foot multi-purpose path and come right up here without ever having to leave their, uh, uh, drive their car. Uh, this shows where the town wanted us to do traffic calming, circles and speed bumps. Uh, this shows the buffer, the areas we're gonna do the buffer around the parking lots. This is an indication of what we like to do. This is Bailey's Glen. So we don't wanna do, a lot of times you can have undisturbed buffers, they're nasty. We like to go in and disturb them and rebuild them and this is what we like to do. So you don't even see the houses behind that. That's right on Bailey Road. Um, this here, we had to identify these courtyards. So this is one of the modification we're asking for because these are larger courtyards. This modification here, we ask for these buildings to be pushed back because we want more area out front for dining. We don't want the building pushed up against the street. We want them for outdoor dining and people to gather. Uh, we put all these connectivities here. We showed where the loading docks were. We showed the trash area here. So this shows all of the things. So everything they've asked for, we've done. Uh, that's the building footprint, which is a requirement. We've provided that. This gives you an, a real good idea of what these courtyards look like. So they're not just big, open, paved areas. They're gathering points. They have water features in them. This is the lifestyle at the uh, village. Outdoor little music, not rock bands. It's a guy who has a guitar, opens up his guitar case, and entertains people. So it's places for people to go, hang out, enjoy. Uh, the experience isn't we just don't go and eat. We want to go and gather. And that's where you get these brew pubs. So this gives you an indication. These are all inspirational pictures of what this project's gonna look like, and it's well designed. Those are the smaller buildings. That's one of the modifications right here where we're asking for a deeper away from the curb because we want this. We want dining tables here. We want trees and landscaping in front of this building so it creates charm and character. It's not just, uh, you know, that's just, we're trying to create a sense of community. This will give you an indication of the hotel with the rooftop bar. This is in Chattanooga. Ours will be a little different design. That's a view from the uh, rooftop porch, outdoor area. It'll have a, a banquet facility. Uh, this is another modification because we don't have the buildings against the street. So the town doesn't have any type of requirements for a lagoon. So it doesn't fit in your ordinance. So we don't want the buildings at the street away from the lagoon, we want the buildings around the lagoon where there's dining, waterside dining, all sorts of activities, 30,000 square foot, fitness center, so it's not just a lagoon, it's a full service club. Six tennis courts, pickleball courts, beach volleyball, waterside dining, unbelievable amount of water sports, I showed you all those pictures, kids club, uh, um, work area where people are working from home. So now you can go right here and you can be waterside working remotely. And if you had to do a Zoom call, put your fancy shirt on, put your Zoom call in, take your shirt off, go back out on the beach. So it's a, it's a lifestyle that we're creating here. Okay, these were the buffers we're putting around the parking lot. This is the kind of fence that goes all the way around the Laguna Beach Club. Six foot high, well landscaped, so there's no access, so it's controlled. Um, this shows you the apartments, four story here, all the connectivities, uh, everything that was required facing, we corrected all those areas. That's an example of the apartments, three, four stories, three stories. That's the floor plan. Uh, they wanted some design for these urban open spaces. So we provided all that. 
Uh, we added the 80-foot buffer, so we took out lots. We're down to 227 lots from 250. We've reduced the lots. Uh, Commissioner Munger asked that we vary some lots, so we have some 50s and 40s and 50s and 60s, so, it's, so we've given some uniform. We, we liked that comment, and we were all embraced it and did it. Uh, one was to get out of this buffer, which we did. So all of the 56 comments, these are what the courtyards, we answered every one of them. We're down to, I think, 11 modifications. This would give you an idea of the type of architecture. It's a beachy theme. Um, they're all on smaller lots. But when you go down to Seaside or if you go down to Destin or that watercolor, this is the feel that we're creating here. So you can go to the beach and drive four hours, or you can drive five minutes and get that same feel. And very few people will tell you they hate the beach. If they hate the beach, they like the mountains. So it, it's, it's just an, to, to go and experience, it's, un, it's sad that you can't bring people to it and experience, because if I could put you all on a plane, take you there, you'd have a whole different outlook and see the value that this brings. Um, what we've put in here is the affordable housing, 20. Um, we put in here that access to Laguna Beach Club will be restricted to members and household family members only. They'll have a limited amount of guest passes. The hotel will have uh, a small area to go into. So it's restricted. One of the concerns from town board members was they didn't want this open water park. So it's a very up at upper scale uh, beach club. It's, it's like being at the Peninsula or the uh, Trump International or even North Stone or River Run. Um, these are the modifications we've asked for. And it was most of them were to uh, increase the height of the apartments, uh, increase the height of the hotel, some block lengths. And the reason we couldn't meet these block lengths is because some it just this there isn't a design for a, a beach club or a lagoon. So we have to ask for modifications on some of these. So you have codes that fit kind of an older model of residential development, and we brought something totally unique here. And um, we used to be excited about bringing a project, not too excited after what we've kind of gone through the last two months, but we think it's a great project. Um, I live right next door to it. My family lives next door to it. So I'm not asking to bring something next to someone's house that I'm not putting next to my house. Uh, so I think that's answered. Do I have any time left or I run out of time? I, you're out, but I mean, we got questions. Okay. We'll cover stuff. Thank so you we've that. answered all of the 56 conditions. We have 11 modifications. Um, we've gone back and corrected the buffer. Um, so we've done everything. Now staff has to have time to review it, but we've sent it to them as quick as possible. Just like as fast as we're doing it, we, we brought the paper to you today to show you that it's there. Okay. Um. I, and I apologize to the applicant. We're, we're, I know we're here in your time, but we're, we're remiss, uh, and I just remembered it when the applicant began to talk. Um, disclosures. I met with uh, several members of the, who are, two who are in attendance here tonight, of uh, the opposition to this project at the end of April with one of the commissioners. Um, all that was said there was, I didn't know, it, wasn't, it was on our radar, not on our plate, and tried to explain the planning board process. Um, also, uh, uh, the applicant requested that planning board members uh, uh, that wanted to meet with us, uh, I think there were a total of four, and they can all identify themselves. Three of us met on the, I believe it was 14th of June, uh, but the condition was uh, we, to the town manager, either he or he had to appoint someone from the town to be at that meeting with us, not because we don't trust the applicant, but because that's good public business. So uh, Brian Richards was there. Um, all, all we did there was ask some questions about the project. And uh, I think primarily um, my main point was is to the applicant was that he that the their project needed to mesh with the with the uh, planning department so that we got a good clean um, uh, staff report. So we tried to emphasize that th that was needed, that some things could be, the 2040 plan, TIA, could be considered, but if it didn't, if it didn't mesh with the zoning ordinance and uh, we didn't have comments from the um, 
planning department we may have a problem making a decision if i can add one thing so the people think that it's underhand and corrupt the town tells us that there's a, either go to a pre-development meeting where it's, there's two of you two of the town board members staff are there or they tell you if you don't want to do that to go and meet with people individually so we have over eight hundred thousand dollars invested in this project so we're required to go to town board members, meet with them, explain the project, and say, do you like this? Can you support it? Now, they don't make an approval, but they give you some guidance. And they'll say, I don't have a problem with it right now, or they'll encourage you to proceed. If, if they tell you no, then you would never proceed to go and spend the dollars that are required to do this project. And it's not underhanded. It's not illegal. Just like presenting to you all and giving you more time than 15 minutes to talk as fast as I can, it gives me the opportunity to explain it in a little bit more detail. So it's it's not illegal, underhanded, or whatever we've been accused of. I, I elaborated a little bit on that. The bottom line is is that I'm required to make that disclosure, and also, to, and I will state this that neither meeting influence will influence the the decision or my vote tonight. And there's three other members I think that that were also spoke there. Maybe four. And full disclosure, Chris Boyd and I met with Jake and Brian Richards also. And honestly, I think that's what needs to happen. You know, we're appointed to try to bring the best plan possible forward to the town board. And I think we deserve to, or I think applicants, developers deserve to have an audience with us. So I have no reservations about the process, and I think it's, it's a positive. I was at the meeting uh, with Frank and Brian Richards at the town hall and Mr. Pilbello, same same thing. Uh, I think it's our duty to to just like we read every email that, that comes to the planning board, uh, you know, for or against, we find as much information as we can. Yeah, that Jay, I, I, that that very last Jody, did you have to? I was at the meeting one? also. I forgot Frank about that. Go ahead. Yes, I, that was everybody. That was. In the various meetings. And going to that meeting, uh, does the meeting influence your, vo your vote tonight? That's, you, need to, you need to make that statement, correct, Jacob? It will not influence my decision it will not influence at all. My decision. It will not influence my decision. Okay. Um, what, what you were mentioning at, at the end, um, you know, when we, when we talk about doing this in the, in the emails that come in um, as, as one of the things, um, you know, I mean, sometimes whether it's commissioners, planning board members, they meet with folks in the neighborhood, other times, and or it could be the same project that uh, they will meet with a developer or their engineer or whatever the case may be, and that helps give us more information and to go down certain paths for more discovery. And so when questions come in, obviously, I would say the, the way we were contacted most often, at least regarding this project, was email. We all read those. I mean, many of you in the audience know I'm, I'm often the one that replies. But I mean, everyone reads it. And that's why, even if it just comes to myself, I copy the rest of the board on there and then push the answer back out. But that does then drive some of our questions, some of the angles that we look at and so forth. And I know that to hold true as we move up a level to the electeds. Um, but that that is what we try and do. And I mean, I had no problem with anyone on the board a couple of them even asked me, and I was like, no, they're absolutely free to. And I apologize for interrupting you, but that, that yeah. was required. I should have remembered it at the beginning. I apologize um, to the citizens. And you've gone so. through the pre-development angle as well with different absolutely. projects. I don't remember the name of it, but of course the one off of, yeah. well, and uh, I was thinking on, uh, <clears throat> off of Asbury Chapel. Yes, with, we did that. I don't know if that had a name at the time or not. Any Hamlin, Michael Jordan project. Yep, that's project true. project that we brought brought to this town. So it, it happens in various ways, and, and we do it. I think it's appropriate that we disclose. Um, and, and in that scenario, 
it's I don't know if it's required, but we've kind of made it a, a baseline that we would have someone from the town there as well. Um, and, and so we did that, but. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Go for it. I'm sorry. But, yeah. Um, going back to uh, Willowbrook and the, to make sure I'm clear, the, the buffer, the original plan had a 20 foot buffer. Is that still 20 foot or have you expanded that? 20 you, uh, undisturbed, 20 that we'll, we're going to plant. So it'll be 40 overall. 40 complete. 40 complete. What's already what's already there, and then you're going to put another 20, 20 feet. The way we do it, which was and you're you're committed time. to that re, to that point. Yes, okay. absolutely. Um, and of course, you're going to build the connector because you're required to build a connector. Okay. That's a subject for a different time. We're also working with Willowbrook to help them with their clubhouse and community, and we're working with them to um, make some improvements to their pool and stuff. So we come into a community. We don't just come in. We, we're offering, so they need some amenities and stuff over there. If this is approved, we're going to help rebuild their pool and clubhouse, and that'll be a condition as well. All right. Then um, I guess I, I've got a couple of comments about. I don't want to, you know, some people joked and said when Lance Munger went through the, every issue that he, you got gammonized, but uh, I'm not going to mungerize you here tonight and go through every issue. But I don't think everybody wants we've, to listen to all this. We've answered all of Mr. Munger's. He's had good questions. Yeah. And we've answered every one of them. We've made all of his recommended changes. But, but I will ask a couple. Mm -hmm. uh, I noted for the staff, too, uh, when you, because you said you're going to, the block length modifications, for example. Um, I've seen no, the, the linear feet for those. That needs to be added. It wasn't included in what was written. I'm sure the staff's on top of that. This, this is in your packet right here, and this identifies all the block lengths and what block lengths exceeded. So for instance, like here, because we're caught crossing a creek, that extends. This one, because we have a creek here, this block length is extended. So we've listed, so you have all those block lengths. Um, they've all been asked, and anything here that exceeds it is, is being requested as a modification. So that was right. provided. That's, that's all the questions I have at this time. You say you've addressed all of these uh, issues and left just 12 modification requests. When did you do that? Uh, we did it is right after we went to the initial town board meeting. Um, we had a list of all. So we got the staff report. So we get the staff report kind of last minute. So then we have to go quickly to, to, to modify that. So we got the staff report just prior to the town board that had all those. Now, all of those things that were in there were really just um, notes and stuff. So, you know, you have to provide, there were code requirements that you have to do in the construction process. But the way this rezoning process, you can see it's like 68 pages, very detailed. So like the things that were on there were block lengths, the buffers, um, sidewalks along the street, showing where the 10 foot multi-purpose path was, showing where the buffers were, and that we've addressed all that. So those are all, you know, your packet includes all of the changes that were made. And then we gave you the 56 items, and then we showed you that we corrected them, and then we gave you to the right the page that those corrections were on. I'm not sure what you're talking about. We had sent an email out to you that um, showed you, uh, let me see it real quick. So he's talking about email. Sent an email out. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about this. Oh, no, no, no. We, we sent an email out that you should have gotten this email right here. Okay. It showed you uh, total, every one of the town's modifications, recommendations. It tells you we've addressed it and it shows you the page number. Understood. So it was easy for you to go in and you didn't have to try to figure out where, what was wrong. Understood. Thank you for that. So <clears throat> with regard to the hotel, you yourself, the development, you know, are okay getting rid of the hotel? That's a recommendation, Do, yes. Yeah, if that's a recommendation. The, the Somebody told you to leave it in there, and that's why you chose to leave it in there after the public hearing. Yes. So what, what we've done is we look for things in a project that are lacking in the community. So we, we like to develop unique projects. So I don't like to – you don't see me developing – subdivision where I just throw houses in. Even Bailey's Glen and Cornelius was a resort complex. So it was a whole project. Um, so the town lacks a quality uh, resort style hotel, a luxury hotel. You need 200 rooms 
to have a full service hotel. I'm in business, I bring investors and stuff in town. There's really nowhere to, to and I have a lot of business friends that are in business, they bring people into town, so where do you bring them? Where do you send them to go? So if you have someone here and you don't wanna put them in a residence in or one of these little courtyards, you have to send them to Charlotte. So we're lacking uh, luxury, full service. Full service means it has a restaurant, has a cocktail area, and it has some amenities. This will have rooftop bar, spa, so it's a really full service hotel that we're lacking. Um, in speaking with Mayor Anarello and Mayor Bales, we've talked about we need a civic convention center. We don't have any place to gather. So we even have Rotary Club and stuff that they have an event and they, they don't have enough, they can't house enough people to really raise a bunch of money. Angels and Sparrows is going to the Peninsula. Big supporter of Angels and Sparrows. They're going to the Peninsula Club because they can't find an area large enough. So our local based charity has to go to another town to hold an event because we don't have anywhere to do it. So we, I had had the university church at one time and I tried to get the three towns mayors to come in there and make that the Kane Center and make it really a civic and art center. So we've been working with the mayors for the last six years to try to find an area to have a large building, a civic center. It's not convention center like Charlotte. So that's why it's here. So outside of this project, you as a developer, do you think that that is the best place for the needed 200 room hotel in Huntersville? That 200 room hotel by itself, unless it has something around it, so it would either need to be next to Burkdale or it needs to be next to something. So it fits here because the occupancy of it, summertime and stuff, has lagoon access as a tropical pool. So by itself, it's hard. That's why no one has come to town and built one because you don't have, you, you got, it's gotta be fit into something so that it works and functions. And, and if not, it, it just, you know, that you won't build it. But what happens in the wintertime? Wintertime you have business travel and, and business. I mean with the lagoon. Lagoon? Lagoon is open year round. So in the, in the wintertime you can use it for paddle boarding, kayaking, um, I don't know all the, like there's there, there's all sorts of activities that you can you wouldn't swim in it but it's no different than you know like our lake most of us have boats on the lake we winterize it and but during the peak times from april to the end of october so that whole facility is going but it has a full service fitness so it's got a thirty thousand square foot fitness club which is bigger than any country club around it's got a tennis facility it's got pickleball um, it's got a lot of things to it to where, because we're seasonal. Like a lot, I mean, our golf courses are open during the winter, but it's not heavy play. So it, it, it plays into its peak period. During the peak time, it's off the, off the chart, the quality of life it brings. Mr. Pillow, can you find uh, this question regarding the private element of the club that you've committed to. Can you find the slide that has that, I, I think it's towards the end. Sorry to put you on the spot here, but. And I know some of this is reaction to the Where do it? community input of the concern about it being potentially open up for day use. And you've indicated that's not your intention. No. Once you do it as a membership and it's a condition, the only way I could use it as public, I'd have to go back for rezoning. If you could find that, though. Um, and the reason I ask is, I don't think the current language goes far enough to accomplish that. Where, and Where's the other? For some reason, it's not coming up. It's, it's OK. It's um, all the way towards the end of the, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going the wrong way. I'm sorry. The Laguna. So uh, Laguna Bay membership access to Laguna Bay Beach Club were restricted to members and their household. So which we have a family membership. So we have different memberships, single, couple, or family of four. Uh, so it's to your family, and then you would be given uh, 15 or 20 guest passes per year. So I get the concept here. My concern is, again, whether we trust Jake Palillo to only do this, but 
let's say you sold this in the future this is the only teat that the town has and when you say it's a member it could easily be a day member you could easily say hey i'm going to make you a membership for the day and this still falls within that restriction yet we basically have opened this up to a good point that's a good point so we can modify that to its you know but that uh, yeah you, i think I, your intention it, is is fine and that's great but i just don't think again at the end of the day i don't think this goes far enough to get myself comfortable with the fact that this would not at some point turn into a day use you can modify it. that goes back to the old liquor where they you had a, they made you do a membership. precisely okay but you literally can come in that day you're a member for a day for a dollar or whatever it is and now you're a member so i never thought of that but yes that's not the intent the intent is to be like a country club like river run where it's a larger membership it's kind of an equity membership when you leave, you can sell and get you know get your money back. But I'm more than happy to make any type of modification that you would want. That um, your membership has to be, an, you have to buy an annual membership or however you want to address. But even that, probably again, I'm not here to try to craft that language. But even an annual membership, you could sit there and say, okay, you get an annual membership for five dollars, and I don't. I think there's a way to craft some language, but I'm not here today to decide. But that's that that would be important for for me. And, and us as well, so so that yeah, we would want to even protect our memberships to know that we're not going to pull a fast one and charge a guy a dollar for a day membership. So I'm very comfortable, and that's a good point to add. That. What about the possibility? I mean, you showed the the map of the um, walkability, and you showed on both both sides of the development. But the the problem is, it's really unfortunate that the land is really the way it is. But you have no. There's, besides the shuttle concept, a way of getting across 73. So I think it would be great to think of a, a tunnel. I mean, or some kind of pedestrian access that all the residents of this area could use the amenities that are just without getting in their car. You know, I think, I think there's a missing piece to this. We looked at that, and the way the land falls, I'm trying to get to the area, so the way this land falls right over, how does this thing work? Right in here, this land falls to where we could get some access there. So that is some of our intent, is to talk to NCDOT because we agree with you 100%, but that's a long process. That's not something that we can say, we're gonna put it, but yes, we think that that would be good. So right now what we've talked with NCDOT is putting a 10-foot multi-purpose path here, and then this will be a signalized crossing. So once they redo the roads, you know, you're gonna have these turnarounds, but the way they do this is they would stop the traffic on both sides. We'd have a 10-foot path here that would allow golf carts and pedestrian traffic to come across. So that will be our crossing to get. And if we go over to the 10-foot um, multi-purpose path, you can see The, the big thing that we wanted here is we wanted a 10-foot multi-purpose on one side of the street. Did I pass it? Okay, so that shows the 10-foot multi-purpose path, so this whole thing is walkable. And then there's our crossing right there to go through the street. That's, that's critical. We've got to, and we've already talked to NCDOT, and that was what they said. They won't give us a full movement signalized intersection, but what they will give us is a light that would stop traffic on both sides, and then we'd have a break in the median there, and we'd have a 10-foot wide path to either put golf cart or pedestrian traffic there. Uh, if we can get this path in, in through here, ideally we'd like to do that. Going above is just crazy expensive because you have to do elevators and and all sorts of stuff and, and that crossing gets very expensive okay. Chris you got more questions I mean it's not really a, a question I guess it is would would the development be able to be sustained with less than 1200 dwellings like do you think we could make it work with somewhere in between the 1200 that you're showing and the 340 by right. 
I mean, it goes back to the old, you know, you know to development philosophy, rooftops and, and traffic, and the mixture of, um, you know, you need the membership in here to make this all work. So, I mean, could you, yes, anything's possible, but it, it um, you know, we eliminated 25 lots. That's $5 million of revenue that comes off of the project. Um, so it, it's a big bite every time you keep and then it gets to a certain point where it just doesn't work. Yeah, so the more people you have around the area, the more walkable it is, the less traffic it actually creates. So you know, if you've got more people that are here and walking to so all of this outdoor food and dining, whether they're a member of the beach club or they're just coming out here to, the experience here is unique in itself too. So it gives you that outdoor dining experience, that gathering point, this big park area. Um, you can do art festivals, little festivals. We've got a grassy area over here if, if anyone ever wanted to do some sort of uh, event. The town doesn't even really have a large area. You know, we do little festivals and stuff. We do them across the street in that little grass area. So those are the things that this town are lacking that we really feel passionate about bringing here. Just a question. Any other questions? I think I have a question for town. Uh, back in, what was the Burkdale? I did. I don't think I lived here when Bur Burkdale got rezoned. How many homes were, were in that? Was it just Burkdale proper <coughs> with the commercial, or were there homes included behind it? Were the apartments to the west included in that? What did that look like? Those were two separate projects. So the Greens at Burkdale Village were one project. That was actually split between Huntersville and Coeur so I don't know the total number. But in Burkdale proper, there's 330 multifamily. Hmm. And it didn't include anything south of 73 or no, anything like that? Those were separate, separate projects. Okay. And what was Burkdale rezoned from? Great question. <laughs> it, was, it was before my time. It was a farm, wasn't it? It was a dairy farm, and it yeah. came into highway Burger King was the only thing that was on the intersection. So Burkdale Golf Course came in first, and then all the stuff around it, and then the actual village, Burkdale Village itself, was after. From Catawba to Target, there's seven uh, multifamily projects with over 21 acres. So that little corridor that you said. I live two miles from there. I lived here 28 years. I was here before Burkdale. I was here before Target. So, yeah. Was the town, it, just because we're going to go back and revisit history, at the time, did the state require the town to have a plan? Regarding like a, like a 20 In other words, it wouldn't have been yeah. a 2040 plan because that was right. No, that's right. a recent law under, under 160D. Right. It have long range comp plans back then. And was Burkdale on the map? I'm not familiar enough with the version plans. Um, it would be, would have been a mixed use type area. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mr. Chairman, just a couple of comments. Um, sure. Just just clarifying, really. Um, obviously, as I said, and absolutely no disrespect to Mr. Palilla, the commentary about how, where the plan currently stands. Obviously, we we still have not vetted that. So, um, just saying that that that's, needs to be demonstrated. That's that's all I want to add to that. Um, with regard to our policies, when someone chooses not to go to the pre-development group, it is not required that you go talk to the board. The, the question was, how do we communicate with the board? And then I think it's, if you'd like to reach out to them individually, you can certainly do that. And that's at any time. So, but that's not specific to a CD rezoning or specifically to this project. So just want to make sure that was clear. Um, I also wanted to just sort of elaborate that you know, the report, as you've seen and you've read, it covers more than just the list of 65 or whatever we want to call it. Those are several pages in the beginning, but there's a lot of other elements in there. So it, it's, you know, there's, there's still there to, to be addressed. Um, you know, the, you've, you guys have already touched on it. That area north of 73, that's a very challenging area. That's where all the density is. It's where it's physically constrained by a creek and odd shapes and um, you know, getting the highest density population walkably down below is absolutely the challenge. Um, so 
things like a tunnel, things like something alternative. I mean, there, there's a, the, the shuttle is an idea, and that's, that's certainly something, but when the 73 improvements come and you've got, you know, the roundabout procedure, it's gonna be very cumbersome to get from those two areas. So definitely thinking creatively is, is what needs to be shown. And then tonight is the first about the golf cart crossing. So again, what is DOT gonna have to say? And then that's gotta be further reviewed by town staff as well. So just a couple of little things there. And again, I know uh, Jake is here and anything else you'd like to ask or hear? So one more thing on the, uh, on the sewer capacity, infrastructure, all that stuff. I, noted, I saw in the report that you guys were recommending not approval because it uses up 11 or 12 percent of future capacity what's on the books right now that they're building it uses 11 12 percent of that why, why okay no, no i'm sorry no well, why did you guys say that that you're not in favor because of that i don't think that it says in t because of that i think what it was illustrating was this is the case mm -hmm. that that this particular project of its scale and size is going to have a, a, a large draw um, but you no know, that was the way that the, and you have the full report with you in there. Um, that is a, we were pre prefacing that that is an issue there that the planning board and the town board would need to consider as they move forward. And I'll double check as you guys talk. But would you say that, I mean, isn't that, any development is gonna use up some capacity, right? Now we're talking about, you know, the buy right using up you know, five percent of the capacity, or this using up twelve percent of the capacity, you know, and that's up to the town board to decide ultimately what kind of capacity you want to use for which development, right? It shouldn't be a just because it's using up twelve, it's not good. Is what I'm saying. I, again, so we work closely with Charlotte Water. So what Charlotte Water basically said is they do a, a fifty-year plan. So they have they forecast out sewer and water capacity to the year 2050. So what it does is it doesn't mean they don't have capacity; it just means that, that area, the way it was developed, so there's no issue. So all it says is, all the carry in Charlotte Water, which they were on a big conference call with Laguna Bay, the Crystal Lagoon people to go through the whole process, simply said all we have to do is plan faster than later for more expansion. So there, there is no issue, but under their current forecast of that land being rural, we'd use up 11% of it. It just means they need to reevaluate quicker than that there's no issue with sewer water capacity. That would be a correct statement. Charlotte Water, for the last 20 years, has been looking at our long-range plans. And they understand we're at 0.9 units an acre, 1.5 units an acre. We're developing at this. When this project came in, it totally changed what they thought this, this geography would need. That 14, that percentage that we have is not just for Huntersville, it serves Cornelius, it serves Davidson, and it serves the city of Charlotte. So th it is a true statement that Charlotte Water can provide sewer service and water service to here. We're just saying that it is out of character with what we had planned for the last 20 years and what they have worked with for the last 20 years. Again, just to complete your question, on page 22 of the report, what it stipulated is exactly what Jack said, that the analysis that Charlotte Water did was based on our long-range plans for that area. So it was just pointing that out. It wasn't objecting specifically. Got it. Chris, you good? Yep. yep. No. Mr. Palillo, the question about the hotel, if I could, uh, how how are you? Say it say it moves forward. I mean, you you wouldn't offer to um, not have the hotel and convention center a part of this if it was to the detriment of the whole project. So let's just assume that it's in there. Uh, how are you going about getting the hotel in this overall process? And the reason I ask is. Even recently, we've seen a couple hotels come through. I mean, not to the projected caliber that you're discussing, but nonetheless, uh, they came through with a special use permit. And, so and we don't have that on, on deck here. What the town had advised us is we could do it two ways. We can go through, they call it, what's it, a SIP? SUP. SUP. So we can do a special use permit, or because this is a conditional zoning, 
we can put the requirement in right now. So we could do it either way. We can get it approved that way, or we can get it approved through special use. And the, thing, the guidance was, do it all right now. So that was, so if you're doing something, I think that's outside, I don't understand, maybe you can explain, but you guys advise me to just do it, do it now. Gotcha. Basically, a hotel do, do um, it's increased height. Uh, if you go more than four stories, you go to six stories in this case, and you're uh, less than 250 feet, you would be required as a condition to apply for a special use permit. That is a path you could go forward with. Uh, the other option is to ask for modifications of the zoning ordinance to not go through that process, but just ask for the additional height here. And that's what Mr. Pillow has chosen to do. Okay. Uh, another question for you uh, with respect to the single family homes. Mm -hmm. um, in your presentations, 900 to a million is, is kind of the projection, the, the target for what those would be. Are there um, any cases, uh, examples, whatever, that would make the case for that price point? And, and the reason why I ask is because I have to imagine that ties into the financials of the overall success with your project, the memberships, uh, and, and so forth, and certainly is relevant to the tax base commentary. So you, you've you come up with those numbers somewhere. So could you share with us how you got them? So what we've, we're going to do is we're going to go back to the old model of like Crest used to do stuff. So we're, we're not going, we've had all sorts of track builders approaches and want to buy these lots. We said no. We're developing the lots. We're selling the lots to individual homeowners. They'll go from 185 to 225 for a lot. They're going to have a builder list and we've already got the builders list built. Simonini, Classica, Grandfather Homes, uh, Meeting Street, uh, What's the other ones? Simonini. So if you look at this, the, the houses that Simonini's building off of Mays Meadows in that area, if you look at Classica, where they're building down, uh, where that Lennar project, where Lennar just built um, on McCord, if you go through there and you go in the back, you know, you're going to see 50 and 60 foot lot. Now, the difference with them is they front loaded theirs. So when you front load it, you have wider for the garage. Ours are a little longer, rear loaded. So if you purchase a home, you can design it the way you want so it doesn't look like a track community. You can add the porches to it. Um, we have the garage in the back. We have ample parking space. So those are the, the requirements that we wanted to do there. So if you're looking at right now where single family new construction housing is going in the 250 to $300 a square foot and you build uh, 2,500, 3,000 square feet, even on the low end at 250 for a custom home, you know, 3,000 square feet, that's 750 plus 200 for the lot, puts you in at 950. So that's the price point. Classica has demonstrated it right off of McCord. Uh, Simonini and all of them are doing it right off the Mays Meadow. That project that was approved in um, Cornelius, it's waiting for sewer on Mays Road. That's the price point they're going. If you go down Stumptown Road, uh, across where, where you get to St. Mark's Church, you turn left, you go back in there where Classica's building, that little village, all those houses starting at 900. Um, if you go right here, uh, Nate Bowman is doing a project. I'm going to get a better clicker here. Right in this area right here, these houses are starting at 800. So those are starting at 800 with a track builder. So this this price point, you know, this is they're going to put all the the the. Uh, amenities in it, but custom homes right now are in that 250 to 300 not price range per square foot. Gotcha. And so even on, it, it sounds like the way you're, you're explaining it, we could probably hit an average of that, the 40 foot lots. We, we may not hit that number, no. but on the 50s and now if we're adding some 60s and whatever. St Up there, yeah. Staff, um, uh, it has to be alley fed and garage access for 50 foot and less, or is it just under 50 foot? 50 and less, okay. So, so the 60 footers. All alley load. You're even gonna have it be so what just What we everywhere. wanted is that, we, we wanted that charm. So if you look at the architecture, we want the porches, so we're gonna require porches. We have a 10 foot multi-purpose path. So where our street structure is the road, 10 foot multi-purpose path on one side, planting strips, and we wanted that trap 
parking on one side so you have adequate room to go. And we want that streetscape. We want to build those trees up. And we don't want all these cars and parking lots and stuff. All that's off the alley, 20 foot wide alleyway. Two, so you have two parking spaces next to the garage. And uh, I think we, in the plan, in, in your packet, you'll see on the back of it, the 68 page one that you, were, you received, you'll see some of the lot layouts there. But that's where we, we came up with the number. Condominiums and stuff, that type of lifestyle above, I mean, Burkdale gets a premium. So where everyone else is getting, you know, dollar eighty to two dollars a square foot, Burkdale's getting two twenty. So those condominiums and that lifestyle, it's not for families, but young couple, um, with all of those dining experiences down below, uh, pubs and stuff, um, those will go in the five to six hundred thousand dollar range. Okay. Uh, one last question. Actually, I forgot I had that one. The um, uh, the TIA again, um, NCDOT, so you're required to do what they say. I mean, that's just, so it, it's going to be a part of it. Um, it. At least for me, this was the first time that I had heard you mention that if the town board wanted more than that, then you would agree to it. Um, we added that as a condition. Cer yes, yeah, certainly we have, There's there's got to be limitations somewhere because if, if it's just worded that way as a blanket statement, if I'm the town board, right or wrong, I'm gonna tell you to just add a lane on 73 and come up with whatever else because it's written as carte blanche and I know that's not your intention. So we need to figure out a way, because that's not realistic, we gotta figure out a way to have that be uh, crafted so it properly matches your intentions. So here's what would happen is the report will go back to Stephen Trott, who's the engineer. Stephen Trott will come back and he'll make a recommendation. He'll say, you know, I don't think you're adding enough. I mean, typically what NCDOT does is they overkill it. So they, you know, that, that uh, Michael Jordan, Danny Hamlin project, we have over $3 million of road improvements. We're putting a signalized intersection there. Um, they make you do these passing lanes. So. NCDOT does not play, you know, they make you do more stuff than that you really think you need to improve their road so they don't have to pay to, to do them. And then sometimes in a case like this, so we'll allocate right now about $3 million in road improvements. It'll probably go more than that. Sometimes NCDOT, now what we did as another stipulation is we said we won't start the retail component until equipment is on the ground widening 73. So we'll hold off that village component. We'll do the apartments, the townhouses, the lagoon, and single family. We won't bring the hotel or village until equipment's on the ground. So if NCDOT delays it, that, that portion gets delayed. But we can word it, and so typically, we would do a TIA, Stephen Trot would look at it, we give it to NCDOT, uh, NCDOT would add a whole bunch of stuff to it, and then you're stuck. So. Unless you know the governor, you don't get any road concessions. Do you know the governor? I don't. Okay. No. Don't send him an email. Um, I, it just seemed like a question I should ask because you brought it up. He doesn't um, have any my email, so. <laughs> the. <laughs> sorry. The. Uh, that blew my concentration. I'm sorry about that. Um, it went. I. I want, I want you to have a little context for why I was asking that question, and this isn't going to be a new idea to you. My, and, and I won't speak for the rest of the board, certainly my concern with the TIA, and it's not unique, is simply the context. Yes, I know you're required, you're agreeing, you're on record as agreeing, agreeing the NCDOT requires it, it's going to be a condition of the thing. I mean, that, that part's all you're clad. The, the concern I have is twofold, it's one that the opportunity for negotiation and additional that is there, albeit maybe it doesn't get used very often, but that opportunity um, becomes very vague in, in going about it the way that's, uh, that you're asking for and that it's being suggested. And, and so, at least for me, creates a bit of consternation with that. The second half of it is more 
the future of someone else other than you comes through and then wants to do it again. But now, what if they're not amenable like you're saying you're going to be? Now we have a bigger fight on our hands and they're just like, man, we don't have, we don't have to do this anymore and we're just going to delay all of them and, and try and punt them till we get further down the road with the thing. And so it's, it's more, um, I mean, you can even argue that it's more theoretical, if, if anything. It's, it's just the, the precedent that that's, it's going at. I do understand, um, you know, the 80 grand and such, that's not, that's not lost on me. That's, that's a meaningful amount of dollars to any of us in the room. I mean, certainly relative to the cost, to, to be fair to just the concept of it, relative to the cost of your whole project. I mean, when you're proposing what is, what, probably the second largest development in Huntersville in, in yep. totality, I mean, you're gonna have big costs, but it's still not lost on me. So I, I do hear that, but just understand again, not a unique point that I'm making, but just that is um, my trouble, um, to, you know, those two angles as with respect to the TIA, but. Uh, so here, here is my point. You, the, they pass laws now that you can't negotiate. So before, you know, I did deals in Cornelius, you know, I was improving parks and doing all sorts of stuff. You can't do this. So you can't, you can't say, well, you know what? We want you to go improve the intersection all the way down there if it has no impact on it. So you can't do, state laws were passed, you can't do that. And, and my argument would be, I would, you know, jumping over to this side, is that rezoning processes are a risk. And there should be a way to where you have a qualified staff to say, in concept, we approve the plan, and then tell me to go back and I have to follow all the rules and regulations. Then if I need an exception, then I would come back before the board for a modification. But the amount of money and time that goes into it, so you're looking at a 68-page design, grading, all sorts of stuff. I don't know if, if uh, uh, any are skilled enough to look at that, to see what all that, so when you look at that, you look at all these grades and stuff, it's, you know, you're looking at it and saying, well, well, how much of that are you studying? And say, well, I don't think the grade here is right. There's so much that goes into a rezoning that at this level isn't needed. And there needs to be some kind of modifications to say, in and so if we brought this plan to you, in, in concept, and you like the concept, then you turn around and approved it and said, okay, go follow all the rules and regulations. Then I would have to come back and say, I need a modification for, you know, block links and stuff. And we can, art, but it, it is, I mean, I've got over $800,000 invested right here. Who knows? And that's the risk you take. And you can say, well, it's an $800, $800 million project. Is $800,000 $800, a lot of money, no matter how you, so, I mean, like Symphony Park costs about 175. So every project that you go forward with all these requirements is, is not just me, but when developers come up here, you have to understand that there's a huge amount of money that goes into it. And uh, that's why you try to get, you try to get a meeting of the minds and say, do you like it, do you under, you know, with, with people. So you try to get some support going in. Because, um, yeah, otherwise. To, to be clear, when I reference negotiating, mm -hmm. it, it's um, not to the level of impact fees, which is what you're referencing, essentially, but it would be just like um, at the last public hearing when Commissioner Munger asked for what he would like to see improvements. I mean, it really is, you have the, the requirements, the baselines, and then it's the planning board, the board of commissioners, asking for possible ways to improve the overall plan. That's the type of negotiating. You know, and, and I think I'm it's important to, too because we they, have, you we bring have up that, so. you bring up good points that we, we like to feedback and stuff. But I don't think you need the level of design and, and topo. I mean, just the survey and just a, there's what is this two two thousand trees we, we're supposed to identify. 2006, your code requires us to tell you the specimen of every tree. So you have to say it's a white oak. You can't just say it's an oak tree. You gotta, so I mean, you have a surveyor out there trying to identify 6,000 trees. So 
It's a, the survey alone was like 110,000 just to do the survey of the property. Yeah. So it adds up. Um, it's a risk, but. All right. But I don't think you're setting precedent by, because that, that TIA could actually be something that's brought afterwards because it, you can't get around it. It's not, it's not anything that you have any risk at. And even if I brought a TIA, I don't even know how to read them. And I've been doing this for years. Um, basically, the engineers will tell you you need to do a turn lane, and uh, you can't get around that. So it's not like you can go to NCDOT and skirt out doing road improvements. And then if I had the TIA here, you would refer to Stephen and say, is the TIA acceptable? And I don't know if any of you are traffic engineers where you could read one of those, but I just look at it and say, okay, what road improvements? I have to put a turn lane here, widen lane here, send it to the grading contract, and see how much it's going to cost. Yeah, I would, I would say in general, and anyone on the board can disagree with me when it comes to the TIA, uh, our focus, <laughs> nice, our focus tends to be more um, level of service, that type of thing. Um, rarely are we getting into the fine details of over here in quadrant six, we need an extra 20 feet in such and such lane, whatever. But um, with the road improvements you have going on, it's hard for them because you're within 24 months of this project supposed to be starting. Right. So just for, uh, they're doing a road widening in front of Burke. I just signed an easement. Um, the, Burke, the, the easement people are now buying easements from Burkdale going over to uh, Beatty's Ford. So they're already in the, the uh, right-of-way acquisition. Um, fall, they're going to start doing a right-of-way acquisition from 115 all the way down 73. So once they start the right-of-way, they're actually, so they're writing, they're bringing you checks. They're not just talking to you. They're buying the, the right-of-ways and they're issuing checks. So yeah. All of that's underway. So those road improvements are going to be two lanes and that super road is coming. Thank you. Uh, that's yes, sir. Just an additional point to make is um, the sequencing of, of the TIA. Um, we have in the 2040 plan the goal to preserve the rural character of Black Farm Road. And it is hard to imagine that if the level of, of the request were to be approved, that DOT or, or the town itself wouldn't look to have improvements on Black Farm Road, mm -hmm. at least as it is to 73. So I'm not saying, I'm not standing here to say that that is the most important element, but what I am saying is, is if you don't know what the list is, you're not able to address all of those. There's multiple issues. Some wouldn't be impacted, but some might. Yeah, I mean, you, you bring that up, and I recall with uh, North Cross Village, I would just call it their their phase two. I know that's not the proper name for it, but all the housing that we saw um, in the presentation that went around the commercial, uh, I was on record as being opposed to that because their their transition from uh, one zoning to another to another uh, was was terrible. They did clean it up a little bit for the town board, and obviously it got approved, but um, that that was one of the reasons. Um, but again, I mean, all of us on the planning board, we look at things from a narrower lens than the Board of Commissioners do. Uh, they have the wider scope, that's why they're elected, and as we like to joke with them, it's why they get paid the big bucks. So, uh, any other questions for the applicant or for staff? You have a motion? I have a motion. Do we have a time? Go ahead. All right. In considering petition R23-05, a rezoning for Laguna, B, Laguna Bay Beach Club, the planning board recommends denial. This, this plan is inconsistent with the following policies. Land use one, following a development pattern that follows the land use map. Land LU2, encouraging residential development that follows the pattern. LU3.1, discouraging rezoning to higher intensity in the TR and R zoning districts. LU5, to focus development where it can support growth in regards to roads and sewer capacity. LU6, to support mixed use in key defined locations. 
LU7, to follow design principles. LU9, to follow appropriate housing design principles. LU10.2, include a mix of lot sizes. LU11, to protect exi existing housing stock. LU12, to preserve landscapes. EOS1, to preserve environment and scenic assets. EOS2, to encourage conservation in the TR and R districts. EOS3, to prioritize tree canopy in TR and R districts. EOS6 to preserve rural and PS9 in regard regards to infrastructure, specifically sewer. Tracy, I have all this written down. I'll be happy to send it to you. Um, it is not reasonable nor in the public interest to approve this plan. These inconsistencies, of which there are numerous, include but are not limited to a total transformation of a rural cor corridor into a fully intensified one. Tonight, we've been nibbling around the edges on minor plan changes and buffers. It doesn't change the overall incredible tripling of allowed density here. Uh, this uh, doesn't, would be a complete departure from our TIA requirements. In eight years on this board, we have kicked projects. Oh, yeah. We've kicked projects for not meeting the TIA. Here, we don't even have one. Uh, there are numerous design insuff insufficiencies, including buildings that don't front public streets or open space, parking lots that don't comply or are missing on street parking, inappropriate or omitted setbacks, excessive block lengths, insufficient open, open space, failure to meet tree save and mitigation requirements. Yeah, that's a long motion. I don't really think that's, that would be your rationale for the motion. These are all the inconsistencies. And so on. Oh, I mean, <laughs> no, really, I flipped a page. Okay. Uh, <laughs> simply put, this proposal and any pending changes would be a radical departure from the 2040 plan. Approval of this project will set a realistic precedent to completely disregard that plan and the planning process forever. End of motion. Second. Okay. All right. We have. Hold on. <laughs> so we have a motion on table. We have a second. Make sure I'm logging this. Uh, discussion. And Mr. Swanick, you made the motion and you have more. I do. Apparently. Go ahead. You have the floor. As I said, uh, there was some discussion about uh, items that have been resolved. I took some notes. Um, got plenty. Uh, but getting back to the main issue that came up from one of our speakers. We need to maintain the character and livability of Huntersville. This does not do that, and this application fails in that in every way possible. Uh, there has been an immense disregard shown for the process, as this is now the fourth submittal. Uh, this has been an incredible investment of staff resources, and every time something gets pushed forward, another deal is struck, another concession made. Here you guys, completely start over. Um, most of this has been negotiated verbally and on social media, not by putting together a coherent plan that makes any effort at addressing the long range plans. There were six pages of deficiencies. Maybe it's down to 12, I don't know. But that's 10 times more than anything I've seen in eight years on this board. Uh, this was clearly made for somewhere, dropped on this map, and see how you can shoehorn that into Huntersville. The overall design is not how Huntersville design principles work in regards to street frontage, open space, block, block length. Again, it was drawn up somewhere else and dropped here. Um, this is a total revolutionary departure from the 2040 plan, which is the guiding document on which we're supposed to make decisions. I think it's unreasonable to expect others to comply with these requirements and then simply toss it out the window because someone doesn't want to do it. In fact, it's the height of hypocrisy. Um, we held the node to a standard of thinning density, and now, right next to that, you can be as dense as you want. It's thoroughly unfair. The developer himself has said on this, and I quote, I have argued that the 2040 plan is wrong. Uh, we can tell you haven't really made an effort to follow it. Um, normally, in issues like this, when we've got this many outstanding issues, uh, there's uh, deferrals. But after speaking with staff, no amount of deferrals changes is going to change the core aspects of this uh, plan are going to change how town staff approaches this plan and won't change the fact that it is what it is. And we have, in my opinion, everything we need to make a decision on this tonight. 
I think we need to do our jobs and enforce the plan we were selected to defend. Uh, Trina, if I can jump in front of you for a sec, because I know customarily you second the motion, that would be good. Mr. Swanick, I want to play off of that for a moment, and it's a question for Mr. Palil. I don't disagree with at least a handful of things that Mr. Swanick said. Where it comes from is that a lot of this is on the, the fly, just in, in in communicating with you over over the years as I've been in the various things, whatever. I mean, just a lot of things go, and then you move fast, and you make a decision, and then we're going, whatever. And so you've been delivering very quickly all this information, which is awesome, because you're, you're getting it in. I think one of the things that I see causing issues, and I'm willing to be challenged by uh, the rest of the folks up here, is just that it hasn't fully been reviewed. Uh, typically, when we get to this situation, at least in the past, we have always made a point to ask the applicant if they would like to utilize one of their deferrals to allow the process, in this case, to catch up. And so I know we have the motion on the table. Maybe I should have asked you before, and I apologize. I don't do this to discredit the motion that you've put forth. But we have offered this in the past, so I, I, I want you to, to be treated the same. That. With additional plan review needed and things you're still working on, on a few things to get there. I know um, the TIA item would not, would not be addressed in, in that amount of time for the way it, it's being proposed. But do you think you would like to take advantage of uh, one of the deferrals that you are allowed based on giving this additional time uh, to be reviewed by staff, having a more proper uh, staff report and actually getting these things uh, taken care of, be it, you know, even pushing it to our next meeting, which is what, July, I don't know, 25th. Is that something you would like to do or are you comfortable going I forward with where we stand? I would defer to you all. If you think that deferring it is going to make you like it better, then I would be okay. But if you don't think that there's the support to support it, I don't know how many more things we can do to um, we believe strongly in the project. We believe it adds value to the project. Um, we disagree with the 2040 plan because we believe that in our experience, Highway 73 is a commercial corridor. Um, and in that piece of land, you got fewer, fewer and fewer pieces of land here. So we think that if you're gonna zone apartments and multifamily and stuff like that, that you should, um, if you lose that corridor for single family housing, then you lose the opportunity to make it commercial. So um, that, that's all up to you all. But I'm almost at the point right now that I like to just get it over with. You know, it's gonna get turned down, the board's gonna get turned, but the last three or four months have kind of been enough for me, so. And the board uh, question, question for staff. This does not stop the applicant from asking for a deferral before the next town board meeting, correct? That's correct. If he changed his mind. That's correct. All right, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, there's two different ways that he could, we could potentially approach this. I suppose I could make a substitute motion to have the discussion on that and see where the board's head is at. Or we could just simply do a, a straw vote. I am. Let's just do a straw vote. Um, the applicant has left it up to us to provide the guidance on this. Uh, let's just do a quick show of hands if we feel that deferral would be better than going down the path of an actual vote this evening. So Can I make a comment? Or is that inappropriate? For my Strava? <laughs> Sorry. This was a big yeah. moment. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Because I, uh, 
I would prefer a deferment, but if the applicant doesn't want to have a deferment, I wouldn't force one on the applicant. That's that's fair too. I mean, it's and let's put it this way: if he flat out said no, then I don't even think I would ask for the straw vote. I would like to get my um, comments on the record because I will not be here in July. So. Oh, I wouldn't dissuade you from your um, comments, but let's put those back because I did jump in front of you to ask, ask that question. But, so you second in the motion, right? By all means. Yeah. So, um, and and deferral is not going to change my opinion on this. Um, I cannot reconcile three hundred and forty with the number of being of homes and and people being proposed especially when we're talking about this being a center, a, com a commercial center where we're drawing people from other towns. This area is not zoned for that. It's, and, and I understand that this is a rezoning, but you, you, you knew what the number was to start with. You, you knew what those those what we had in mind. And the 2040 plan, I cannot sit here every month and tell other applicants that we are approving or denying something based on the 2040 plan and then look at you in the face and say, oh, but you're different because you don't believe in it. I have to, in my core, believe that this plan was put together to guide us as a board through the next 20 years and to guide the development that we collectively want to see happen. It's really important for me to sit on this board and say, I'm going to reference back to this every single time I make a decision because that is our guiding principle. And it's not that we can't deviate in, in little ways, but this is not little. This is a big, huge deviation, and it creates a, a, a town center where, yes, it's only a mile and an eighth or two miles or whatever, whatever you want to call it from the, the town center, but I like so many parts of this it doesn't fit the character. It, it's too big for that particular area. And I understand there's no other area within Huntersville to, to accommodate. But it feels like we're fitting a round peg or a square peg in a round hole. I feel like to address the most important part of my life is these kids. And the last four months of what's happened, I, I don't want to defer it. I want to get it over with, whether it's going to be approved or not approved. And the, the, the circus that's been brought out of a good project and the slander and the nonsense that's gone, it's enough. I'm not putting them through 60 more days, 90 more days. So whatever your decision is, we respect it. Um, Symphony Park was 320 units, beautiful community, doesn't fit the 2040 plan. But I respect what your opinion is, but I'm done. Okay. So out of that, I won't even. The slander, I won't even the embarrassment, the smear, the nonsense that's gone on is enough. Okay, thank you. All right. So discussion then with the motion on the table. Anyone else? I have some. Oh my God! Tell me. I'll go. <laughs> um, I live in East Huntersville. I think we need more amenities on East Huntersville. From a selfish standpoint, I think this would be a welcome addition over there. Um, I think that the applicant, actually, I like the plan. I like what it has in it. Um, but at the same time, I can't look at this from what I personally look at or what I like. We have a 2040 plan. And no matter how much I really want to try to figure out how to reconcile that with me to be able to support this, I just can't do it. Um, at the end of the day, I do go back to the 2040 plan. There was a lot of time, effort spent on that. 
And I get the argument that Highway 73 will carry a lot of traffic and that would make logical sense for there to be density there. Well, I go back to uh, policy LU 3.1. You know, it even says in there, growth management was a number one priority for survey response. You know, just because a road can carry a lot of traffic does not necessarily mean we've got to pack a bunch of density around it. You know, part of the charm of Huntersville is you do have rural areas. And so what if there's a rural area that, you know, you have a highway cutting through it? That's okay with me. Um, so again, it's a project. Mr. Palo and your team, I mean, again, I think it's a great, great idea. I really do. I just think it's in the wrong location. And I get what you're saying. We have limited land left in Huntersville to do something like this. I don't know if it'll land somewhere else. Um, and then that's why it's a question about, you know, trying to figure out how to support this is my question about we've got the activity center that basically is a stone's throw from your project. But even I can't even reconcile that because, again, the activity center is not intended to be this dense. If that was in the 2040 plan noted as a mixed use center, then I think it'd be easier for me, because again, I don't think these circles are absolute circles. They're not. They're not intended to be. But the fact that it is only an activity center, not mixed use, I just can't take that big step to be able to support it. So, you know, I, I just went back to the buy right. You know, the 340 homes out there. Um, I don't think I would like that um, just because it, it doesn't add any character. I, I like the lagoon idea. It's a cool amenity. And I think if run right, it could be really nice. Um, you know, I don't like the hotel. I don't think it's in the right spot. I understand where you're coming from and people recommended that you leave it in there. But I just don't think four miles off of 77, granted it'd be next to a cool lagoon that it's in the right spot. Uh, yeah. Um, so um, with that being said, you know, I don't think 1,100 dwellings is right either. So somewhere in between, I don't know what it is. I feel like uh, another developer could come in here and say 500 homes, no amenities, and more than likely everybody would be okay with it. So it's, it's somewhere in that neighborhood, and I get you need rooftops to, you know, you know, get the restaurants in there and get the retail in there. I understand that. I don't know what that number is. But, uh, but I like the lagoon. I like the, you know, the concept of that. You've done a good job with other developments. I don't think that you, know, you would skimp on this one. I just don't like the hotel, um, and that's kind of where I'm at. I came in tonight uh, prepared to, regardless to vote, if it was a denial to vote against that. But I'm sitting here, this, I've been on this board for five years. Tonight is my fifth year on this board. And my consistency in voting uh, has been using the planning department's staff report. Um, I can't use that staff report. I, I trust everything. I have no reason to distrust the applicant, regardless of what's on social media. I trust what the applicant says that he's going to address, he addressed every item, but that has not been vetted by the staff yet. I need it to be vetted by the staff to hear their comments so I can compare what, he, what the applicant says and what the staff says so I can make a decision about each one of those items. We do not have to agree with the planning department, but I need to know what the planning department says about what the modifications are and the impact of that because they're the experts on the zoning ordinance. What I know, they've taught me. What I don't know, they haven't taught me yet. So they're the people I go to to get that information. So that's what's holding me up. 2040 plan, hey, it's a guide. We've made adjustments before on this board, at least the last five years I have, when it was a 2030 plan, then became the 2040 plan um, as we've gone. So you, you can argue that. That's like the preacher at the church versus one Two preachers arguing about verses in the Bible. Um, you pick the one that works best for you. But it is a guide, and, and it is a good document, but it is a guide, and it can be adapted. Um, the other thing that, that I just want to point out is we got to, that area right now, they're, the, they're in the budget, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jack, in the budget, money has been given to the planning department 
to create a new Highway 73 corridor plan, and within that plan, to look at the land, land use view, review in that corridor. Is that correct? Or am I off a little? You're correct. We have $150,000. All right. So, and that needs to be done, and I'm going to tell you why it needs to be done. The reason it needs to be done is because if you look, put this in the center of the map, put that intersection right there in the center in East Huntersville, you got I-77 to the west, you got I-85 to the south, you got I-485 to the south. You've got 100,000 people that live north of that highway. Cornelius, Denver, Mooresville. You got a hundred and, uh, around 160,000 people that live just a few miles to the east in Concord and Kannapolis. You've got our population. You got 890,000 people living in Charlotte down below. This and the Charlotte statistical area is the third fastest growing urban area city in the United States. And we see that every day by the number of people that are moving into this area, and they're still coming. That is a major east-west corridor. That is that highway, Highway 73, is the number one priority, in my opinion, for the town of Huntersville to make sure it's done right so we don't get split like what happened to Independence Boulevard. You got to look, there's going to be a high, I don't know when it's going to happen. Maybe Ed, Ed Cecil and I will be on the ground by the time this comes. But Prosperity Church Road connecting uh, Eastville with Highway 73 that goes right through North Village. That's going to be an intersection, major four lane highway. Tell me when that highway goes in. This area right here is going to be developed commercially, and it's going to be dense. It's going to be, I know Highway 21, that intersection with 73 by the interstate is, you know, it's within two miles of the plan, the zoning ordinance and the 2040 plan saying that's high density. This is just as an important intersection for this town in the future. Look beyond 2040. What is this town going to be for our kids if you want your kids to stay here in this town? They're not, the farmers can't keep their kids here. That's why they're selling their farms. And they're selling it to developers, and they have a right to sell that property. That's their 401k. So the only thing that's holding me up here is, is uh, I don't have a clean staff report where I can write uh, a clean motion for, for this project. I like, I like the project. I think that that portion, the lagoon and everything, is within distance and can be argued within the distance of the activity center. And people, you know, everybody's allowed their opinion, and, and that's okay. I like that. Just, be, just play nice. You, I, I will commend. I know the chair will say something at the end of this. I commend everybody in here for playing nice tonight. You're a very good group. And the last thing I'm going to say is I'm going to say something because I have to about Jake being on the HOAB. I serve, I'm, I'm on the planning board as the, as the planning board representative on the HOAB. Uh, the applicant came to that board a few months ago. We haven't met in the last two months. And I've heard nothing but common sense come out of him when he's up there about, uh, we're talking about text amendments. And he is legally on that board. He can't be on any other board in this town, but he's legally on that board. Jay Henson was on that board. He's the developer. That board needs a developer on it so we get that perspective. So I'm, I've just had to say that because I'm tired of hearing that argument. But everybody has their opinion. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Any other? Okay. Jody, go ahead.
think it's exciting. I think the sad part is that where the Baltimore hit, where the land is. And because it's long and the where it is is across my highway, it makes it really hard for everybody to vote differently, I think. But um, I definitely don't think it's our best. Um, like you said, I think it's a great project. I mean, I think, uh, I think it's unique. I think it's very unique. It adds something very different for our town. I mean, 2040 plan, how many long range plans have placeholders for something like this? It's unique. So yeah, there's gotta be some variation. We need to look at that. Look at the area, it's rural. What was the area 20 years ago? I mean, the same thing happened previously with the other neighborhoods. You know, we it was farmland, subdivision, now we want to stop. Um, I support the project. I think uh, the town is obviously growing. It's a great place to live. We have a lot of people moving in here. Where are they going to move? You know, we keep sprawl out, take it out further, go out another five miles and, and, and spread that out. I think it has a lot of merit. I think it has a, a great attraction on 73 that is a all intents and purposes it is a commercial corridor we've got you know shopping centers each direction very close um, I think along 73 it does fit in there um, you know the TIA that we can debate that forever everybody's had their opinion we actually a couple years ago had discussions on getting rid of the TIA in Huntersville why because there is and it was to the board and we actually changed the uh the numbers and, and and the reason is it's like ncdot controls most of the roads so it's going to be their decision what they want to do and if the town had required additional studies on the roads i think we'd have a different probably have a little different opinion but if it's all passed along to ncdot i get that I mean, the 2040 plan, is it perfect? No, it's a, like everybody said, it's a great guide. It's gonna change. It's gonna change soon. We're gonna have another case come up. There's gonna be modifications. If we followed the 2040 plan by the book, we wouldn't even be up here. We wouldn't have rezonings. So um, I don't support the motion. I do support the project. Anyone else? Me? Okay. Um, it, just so I, I can see some confusion on some faces out there. So everyone understands, especially when it's a application, a project that's uh, to this scale, right, to this importance, we explain ourselves. This is why we do that. And so you may not agree with everything that's set up here. But that's why it's done, and we volunteered to represent you. And so that's why we're doing it. So it, 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 shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't require such bizarre responses, uh, you know, these mystical looks on our faces as to why we're saying this. Uh, we're up here in this position and to explain ourselves, um, and that is what we signed up to do. Uh, what Frank said, I'm going to tell you, I agree with a bunch of it may not say it in the 2040 plan. I think what he's doing is more giving everyone a heads up, a warning. It's going to change. You're, there will be a plan that will come along that will no longer lock that up as rural, and it's just the way it's going to go. The traffic count is there. It will happen at some point. The plans don't align with that now. And so this is, this is why I'm not in support, because it is too far of a stretch. It is beyond the spirit of the ordinance. That's a big part with the tool. Is it in, in spirit of the 2040 plan, the guide of, are there certain things that justify it? Yes. Are there plenty of things that don't? Yes. I, I mean, not what you want to hear, but I just think you're ahead of your time. Right? When I heard, however long ago it was, rumblings that 
there's a lagoon development coming. I knew it was you. Because I don't know that there's anyone else in Lake Norman that goes so outside the box as, as you do. I, and, and so then a few months later, I found out it was, and I was just like, yeah, absolutely. And then I've watched it come through. Now, it's, it's gone awry as what's happened over the last year in, in town, and that's been disappointing as a citizen to witness. Um, I don't like hearing it from applicants going out to the community, and I don't like the community firing back in this way um, when we have people like you to try and set the example for. Uh, so I have appreciated the way tonight's gone. I wanted you to have the same experience and rights that everyone else does that come up here. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how much money you'd make on this. I don't care if I'd want to sit down and have a beer with you or not. None of that plays into a decision. And I wanted you to be treated the way you were this evening. And I wanted us to treat everyone out there as fairly as possible as well and give you the opportunity to speak and actually be heard when you're up there. I may not agree with everyone as certain projects come through. The thing that I appreciate is the passion, the fact that you're sitting here in this room. It's been pointed out, I think you brought it up with your, um, your, uh, why am I, your, your petition, the number in the petition. And you bring up the number of people. And now I'm not gonna, I don't like your petition, as it were, but the number of people that signed that, you made a comment that wasn't really about the petition or this project. It was that there's more people that signed that than essentially what you were saying than what it would take to be voted mayor. Now, if we think about that, and the number of, and I'm, I'm obviously wandering, and I apologize, but if we think about that, the number of voter eligible people in this town and how few pay attention, that you can get elected mayor with 5,000 votes, that just blows my mind. So that's why I appreciate everyone that's in here, whether I agree with you or not. I just want it done respectfully. I, everyone else devolves over uh, the last few years, and local government, to me, is the stuff that affects all of our daily lives. And so we should pay attention more. Yes, we can be passionate about what we're bringing to the table, what we're trying to get done, what we don't agree with. But, you know, we talk about Huntersville losing that small town feel. I, I don't agree with it. But, I mean, if there was ever something that's not small town, it's the way we treat each other when projects like this come up. There's no way small town handles things like that. So. Um, I don't know. That's all I got. I guess I apologize for that. But uh, so we got a motion on the table. Is there any more discussion? I'd like to make one more comment. Um, I know there was some discussion about how many changes and modifications there were to this plan, and, and some criticism against the applicant for making so many changes. In his defense, it's 250 plus acres. There is a lot that goes into this. So I don't want us to start going forward going, well, if there's 60 modifications, we got to throw it out. There may need to be 100. Again, we've got a very detailed ordinance. For them to try to put all this in here, it's going to take some modifications. So this is just going forward. Developers come before us. They're, they're investing their time and money in our community. That's what we want. We get the end product. So let's not try to villainize them to where they don't come in because we're not reasonable. That's all. All right, any other discussion on the motion? Okay. Uh, show of hands, how would this be worded? Show of hands, all in favor of denial. We'll go like this. One, two, three. Any opposed to denial? That, I know. Reluctantly, yes. What I, I look that way. You no, no, you're no, on I, that. So we got three. So it's no. no wait. One two. I, 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 I gave my reasons for voting about the staff report not being complete. Just call the vote. So I voted against. I voted for the motion. Six 
So you voted for denial. So we are six to for denial. That's what you have, because that's what I have. Okay. All right. So that is the end of 4C. Thank you, everyone. Um, Okay, thank you for the uh, 
the opportunity to take a quick break. We actually are on to other business, and we finally have something on there. Um, I don't have another speech prepared. My God, I've done plenty of those this evening, so I'm going to stop. No, the, no, no. What we're doing, though, no, I'm not giving it to you, is we would like to acknowledge the outgoing member that is Stephen Swanick. Um, what do you have, eight years? Is eight that what years. it was? So eight years on the planning board, uh, Huntersville citizen, Huntersville business owner. Um, you are one of the people that taught me how to be in the seat that I'm in right now. Uh, so I guess if I'm not doing a good job, that absolutely falls on you. I'm and sorry, so, everyone. Yeah, so we'll pass the buck. It wasn't you that taught me to just run on and on with, with all my uh, speeches and shoot from the hip. So I'll at least pull that off of you. But uh, you have given your time. You have term limited out. I know and I'm confident that we will, of course, see you around town. I'm probably going to see you come up to the podium, even if just to torture us a little bit with some random public comments. Can I have more than three minutes? No. <laughs> no. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my three minutes. Uh, yeah, you you're going to. But uh, you'll probably be the person who will have some big meeting, some big project like this, whatever, and you're going to come up three minutes on why the town should institute Taco Tuesday as an official. That would be something you would do. So, And Downtown I would appreciate Social that. District. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so at least for me, I say thank you for uh, being one of the examples and allowing me to grow into this spot. So thank you for that. Um, I want to. I don't know if I don't know if we do this, but I'm just going to make this up right now. You absolutely get to take that because we're not going to need it anymore. So that's a memento. <laughs> here, here, throw this away for me. Whatever. Uh, Thank you, Jeff. HPD is not here, so they can't do anything about it. We and the town, more importantly, would like to present you with that as a uh, token of your service to the town and all its citizens. This is fantastic. And that is it. Would you like to say a few words? If you don't mind. First of all, thanks for, for this. I wasn't expecting but, some love. Wait a minute. Do you, do you want us to go first and then you finish? Oh, oh wow. Everyone, please, please. Yeah, I'll keep it short and sweet. No, uh, is this a roast? Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I make the plan better, yes. Yeah, you know, when I first turned on my screen during COVID, my first meeting, all I saw was just like white hair, like out here. Yes. It was crazy. No, uh, no, see, I appreciate, um, you know, all the help you gave me when I first started and definitely, um, you know, changed my mind on some things, made me think about things differently, and I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for your service. Thank you so much um, for helping me understand the process of what goes on here. Um, I know it hasn't been very, it, I guess it's been over a year, but it, I mean, it doesn't feel like it's been that long. And um, I, I feel more confident, you know, doing the, the motions and, and things like that. Um, and I, I do think that that comes from a culture of, um, I don't know, just helping everybody out, helping each other out. And I, and I appreciate that you've cultivated that. <laughs> it is a roast. Well, you know, I, I tell the truth. Stephen and I butted heads when I first got here. Um, I think a little bit, Rub. And um, then the last uh, couple of years, we've sort of leveled out and uh, worked. We've always worked together, but I mean, work closer. And you'll be missed on this board. Um, ex the experience will be missed. Um, maybe the town board at some point will relook term limits for people that want to stay. But that's only a year. There's always the HOAB. Six, <laughs> six months and they put new members on. I just want to point that out to you. Jack's going to come to the planning board when he retires. <laughs> just as a joke one day, that's all. But <laughs> he'll, be a, he'll be a guest member. <laughs> but... Uh, no, good luck. I'll, I'll, I'll see you around. Crafty 760. You got my phone number. Good luck.
Good riddance. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, actually, Greg sent along some comments. So I'll start by reading Greg's. Oh, wow. I was, he, he thought it was important. He wanted, he, he, he saw he missed your last meeting. Hey, your stuff comes in email, you know. Go ahead. Yeah. This is from Greg. No, this is from Greg's heart. I was disappointed when I found out Stephen's last meeting with the planning board coincided when I was going to be out of town. I wanted to get my gratitude for his service with the planning board on record. When I first started with the planning board, Stephen had a mohawk haircut. <laughs> I quickly learned that his persona brought a relaxed attitude to the board. It encouraged me to not take ourselves too seriously. When he was elected chairman, I was apprehensive, not because of Stephen personally, but because I was comfortable and didn't want a change to the board. Again, I quickly learned that change was okay and that Stephen brought an approach that openly encouraged board members to express their opinions. So Stephen, thank you for your service and I wish you continued success with your endeavors, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'll say a couple of comments. Um, it's been a pleasure serving with you. Um, thank you for the service community. Um, I've always respected your practical, pragmatic approach. As Frank said, you and I have not always seen eye to eye. We've probably seen eye to eye on more items than not, but we've had our moments when we did not. And I think we showed respect to one another. And I would say that's the other thing you've always showed, even no matter how passionate you may have been about a topic, you always showed respect to fellow members and everyone else. So for that, I thank you. Um, and I also appreciate, appreciate the fact that we become friends. So I know that will live well beyond uh, serving together and uh, look forward to it. And I have a mulligan. I just want to point this out. The first time I met Stephen, I think he was 17. He was playing football at North Mech with my, and my son. He, he, and, he and my son played football together at North Mech along with along with Big Country. <laughs> yeah. I, rem I remember saluting you in the parking lot and then not being able to sleep, sleep at night because you were in uniform. Like, oh my God, did he think I was mocking him? No, I was actually trying to show respect. What's the right thing to do? So. That's all right. I knew, I knew that's the same attitude. You got the same attitude now, so I, I don't worry about it. And I just want to say thank you for, you were leading the board when I came on and you were very helpful in getting me in. And, um, and I guess I've gotten to know you kind of more as a person, uh, which has been great. You were very kind. And, um, and I just want to thank you for your service. It's been great serving with you. Yes, Stephen, it's been great. Hate to see you go, actually. But uh, I enjoy the uh, positive uh, attitude. And, uh, it, yeah, it, it, it radiates. And uh, it's very much appreciated. So good luck. And what, see you in a year or when? How long do you have to stay off? Yeah, I've got my number. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a year. Right. We, uh... Staff, you want wow. to chime in? I, I'm just glad that I was Woo. here for your Swanick song. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, oh man. I'm sitting on that one all day. Um, no, I mean, we. Uh, all I would add is um, I mean, it's, been, it's been great to... Uh, the only thing that we look for, or, or the thing that I, I, I'll only speak for myself, is you have always educated yourself on the issue. You have always made sure that you have read everything, researched it, looked into it. And we certainly have not always agreed, um, but that's not the point. It never is. As long as you're coming at it from the perspective of informed and what you truly believe. And I think that's what you've done every time you've been on the planning board. So, good luck. I, I'm blown away. I wasn't expecting this. Um, I'm really grateful to all of y'all for the kind words. Um, hopefully I can get to return some of them. Um, I can't believe these eight years have gone by so fast. Like uh, it was said, I had a mohawk and then I grew out the George Washington hair during COVID and it was just a silly thing. Um, <laughs> it has been an honor and privilege to serve on this board. Um, I hope in some way I've made a difference for good for the town. Um, I just want to thank a lot of people, uh, Jack, Brian, David, Tracy, everybody uh, on town staff, first of all. I came into this with a very low opinion of the effectiveness of government, and I'm walking away with pure admiration for the planning department, staff, everybody. Um, if government doesn't function, it's because the elected folks don't listen to y'all enough. So 
<laughs> I'm glad that's on public record. Um, I want to thank uh, Hal Banker, Jen Davis, uh, the pre my predecessors as chairman for being such effective mentors and examples. Um, I think a lot of what we've done the past years of setting up a outgoing chairman, Chairman Emeritus has helped an in information transfer. Um, and I hope, Jeff, that you will continue that and your successor on board. So a lot of that goes um, back to, uh, you know, I said Hal and Jen setting that precedent. Uh, a couple other of the long-serving folks, Joanne Miller, Joe Sailors came to name, um, long-tenured PB members who I'm about to join in the great beyond. Um, and also I want to thank all of y'all up here. It's been fun debating, considering, agreeing, disagreeing, um, and I wish y'all the best up here without me. Uh, I'll just close by saying to anybody that's still listening, uh, like Jeff harped on, continue to participate, but do so with kindness. The only way this whole thing work, works is if those that have opinions share them, but do it in a way that doesn't alienate people that could be persuaded. Um, as Dale Carnegie said, it is possible to disagree agreeably, um, and your opponents don't have to be enemies. So uh, we as a society can and should do better, and I hope that the way tonight went can be you know, small way of how things should be. So thank you all. Thanks for giving me this platform to speak. Thank you for my, like I said, my lovely parting gifts. These will go straight to my office where I will look at them with love every day. I might have stole that. I'm, I'm going to get a talking to after. <laughs> it's, I'll, I'll cover it. It's totally worth you know, it. You pay for it. It's not stolen. Stephen, thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and make the motion to adjourn. Can I get a second? I didn't make the motion to adjourn. Can I? No, you're going to. Do you want to make the motion? I was going to give you the honorary. Oh, God, this is. Do you second the motion? Okay. No, second it. In the microphone, officially. I second the motion to adjourn. <laughs> All those in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Bye, everybody. There it oh. is.